Six whole season. Yeah, 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 whatever. You get the rest. So if you don't know, last month I uploaded ranking every single Gumball episode from seasons one to season three, and now here is the rest. Season four through six gets so wild and different from the whole rest of the show i literally i consider it a different era so i've been excited for weeks while i've been making this to like actually show you guys what's up but i've been slow as hell also there's gonna be a link in the description for a playlist of all the music i use in the video because that's like most of the comments i see on the other one and if you don't know about my social media or don't follow me on like twitter insta <sighs> This cutting board uh, got delivered in my mail uh, like yesterday. I want to thank everyone that's watching new or old that's been around here. Thank you so much for giving my channel a view, a sub, and we hit 100,000 like a few weeks ago and um, it's been huge. This is my first like real validation of being a YouTuber. Guys, you know what it is. I need you to do one thing. Before we get deep into this video, I just need to do one single thing. Enjoy the video. Honestly, man, that's all I hope. Thanks for 100k. Please. We now hit season four in our adventures of Gumball. And I gotta say, we hit a really interesting one for this because season four is so all over the place. It will have the best episodes I've seen and the worst episodes I've seen right next to each other. And it's kind of kind of strange. Anyways, baby, season four starts with episode one, the return, the return of the show, the return of the kids, the return of the summer. As Richard tries to get back Gumball, Darwin and Anais after accidentally leaving them in a mall ball pit. And when he gets to them, he realizes he might be a little bit too late and the pool almost gets shipped off to a third world country. Those kids sinking, getting lost, the paperwork. In the end, we did the only responsible thing. Sold it to a country with less child safety laws. You mean I exported my kids? And technically, he's exporting them. For the first episode, it really gets in your face with this new season. All of it just seems really loud. It's got a few repeating gags that they try to hammer. It made me realize something I'd like about the gumball episodes I do like. I said this last season with the show, but the episodes that end quickly and normally. Sometimes with an episode right before it ends, they'll try to throw in one last joke or one last gag to try and, you know, get that last laugh or stretch the episode to 10 minutes. In this episode, they could have easily done like the bait and switch. Like Richard goes to pick up the shipping container where the kids are stuck in. It turns out the kids aren't actually in there. It's a bunch of tigers and the kids uh we cut to them in singapore or something i'm actually kind of glad that they were just in the container that he actually grabbed and we got to a good ending number two the nemesis uh well i said last season that he'd be important now so here it goes our boy rob gets another episode and he wants to be an even better nemesis to the watersons but he has literally no clue how to be evil so after interacting with the boys for some reason they teach him how to ruin their life better and he transforms it from little boy rob into dr wrecker with this cool new cardboard clothes and his new hot voice voiced by david warner oh this is ridiculous why do i have to get dressed like this because you don't see villains spending 10 minutes hopping on one foot pushing their leg through their armored pants come on lower your head over the course of the episode, Rob tries to destroy the town, and the boys just end up making their own villain worse and more evil by the end of it. And he's just a chud. Even though he doesn't even destroy the town, he still gets the last laugh. I like this one because it does a good job explaining what Rob's about, and it shows him to be a pretty good villain, as he isn't fully a bad guy necessarily, but is driven to that point by sheer hatred of the main boys and being directed by the main boys to have a place in this world. So I like that they have these kind of cute interactions showing him building up to be a big villain and not just being super evil right off the bat, because he has to learn, you know? Character development. Development. Also, can we please talk about this incredibly smooth stuff that Gumball and Darwin did? Damn, how'd you do that? So I want to say rest in peace to David Warner. He passed away two months ago. Episode three, The Crew. I really thought I wasn't going to like this one, but it's such a goofy storyline that has become one of my favorites of the season. Gumball and Darwin are lame. They got no drip, no cash, don't got a crew, no hose. And they're sad about this until they see the hardest crew in Elmore pull up on their block. The senior citizens are here and the boys are both tired of being lame and not being in any sort of gang. So they want to join in. So to be able to join the senior citizens crew, the boys have to age themselves up to blend in with their new gang. Before they can fully join the senior citizens, they have a job for them. Basically, they need to go and give Louie, an ex-member of the crew, a message after he left. Send him a message. <gasps> a, a message? Yes, a message. Is it a message message? Yes. A serious message? Yes. Can you take care of it for the crew? Sure. <laughs> we'll take care of it. <laughs> Wait. Right now. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, first I just gotta uh, watch my soaps and um, uh, write an angry letter to my congressman about uh, how things were better when things were worse. And, um Misunderstanding Marvin's message, the boys actually have to try and escape the senior citizens after sprinting away thinking that they want him to kill Louie. The reason why I said I thought I'd hate it at first is because I genuinely thought this whole episode was gonna be haha <laughs> funny cuz old. As the episode went on, it got more and more creative and some of the shots thrown at elders was crazy. I felt like they really tried with this one. It was great. Episode 4, The Others. Okay, okay, okay. The Others. So this one messed with me a little bit because I've never been more divided on an episode in my whole time of doing this video. So, this is The Others. It's kind of like that other episode from Season 3, The Extras, where we explore the background world of Gumball and get to know the other citizens of Elmore. When Anais tells Gumball and Darwin to open their eyes to other people and lets them know about the fact that they're not the only ones in Elmore, we meet a girl named Claire. And we get to know her entire story in this episode of the so-called world of Claire. So Claire is depressed and sad that she's moving away from Elmore and she has to say goodbye to tons of her friends and including the love of her life. But Gumble and Darwin keep on inserting themselves into her story. And today is the worst day of my life. My dad has lost his job. We've lost our house and now we're forced to move back to Detroit. I only have one day to say goodbye to the ones I love. One last day to say goodbye to my so-called world. But luckily, two strangers were about to change my life forever. That's right, Gumball and Darwin. Gumball was devastatingly, inhumanly beautiful. His face was like a classic painting crafted by an old master. Uh, who are you? I didn't realize it yet, but these two were the true heroes of my story. Now this is where I got divided. Okay, so this episode criticizes and pokes fun at two different things. Themselves and people who take things too seriously at the exact same time. Gumball has always been this colorful and funny show where the boys always overcome their odds. There's always a next time. Whereas Claire's show is more realistic and she points out that that's not how the real world works. The world doesn't revolve around them and sad things happen to other people, whether the boys want to acknowledge it or not. Which is a true message, but Gumball makes a comeback with another message that I think is perfectly summed up by this clip. Huh? Yeah, basically, Gumball solves all of Claire's problems in one fell swoop after hearing her moan and complain and trying to convince her to keep on giving it a try and how this doesn't have to be the end. And in this clip, Gumball acknowledges how, one, this world isn't as sad and bleak as you make it out to be. The world is what you make of it, and it's amazing. And how, two, if life throws hardships at you, no matter the circumstances, you shouldn't just give up and take the beating, bro. You gotta fight back. I think these are both great points to learn, though they seem to directly oppose each other. And not to mention, at the beginning, I wasn't on Gumball's side at all because the boys got so annoying at a point just inserting themselves into Claire's story. I was genuinely interested on what Claire had to say, but they kept on bumping in at the worst moments. But as it went on, I realized, wait a minute, they're trying to make a point here. Scratch all that, I'll rank the episode pretty high because it's really funny, but my biggest concern about this entire thing is... Why is Banana Joe so big? Why is he as big as the that makes no sense? Episode five, the signature. Richard is once again not happy that Louis wants to marry his mom and move far, far away with her. But this time, Richard has an idea. After hearing a little bit about adoption papers and how Louis follows his father's orders, he tricks Louis into signing them, which legally makes Louis his son. So yeah, now Richard is technically the dad of his stepdad, which then Richard goes on to forbid him and his mom's marriage. And then this happens like four more times and there's a whole 
whole lot of confusing adoption stuff and family fighting that technically leads to the oldest relative Watterson being Frankie. And technically he's in charge of the household and the marriage and everyone. Frankie is Richard's actual dad. But once we meet Frankie, we realize that Richard's mom was right. He's a damn liar and a scammer. And he tricks the Watersons into almost selling their house to him. This man left his whole kid and now he's trying to steal his house. Last second though, however, he realized that he couldn't do that to his own flesh and blood. So he apologizes, giving them back the house, leading to a happy ending. And I gotta say, man, there's a flashback section in here where Richard remembers back to when Frankie left. And that section with little Richard waving to Frankie as he's leaving to go and get the milk was so goddamn sad, despite it only being four seconds long. This good ending stood out to me more than most, as you just leave with a warm feeling inside. It, it do be tugging at your heartstrings, though. Number six, The Check. There's just something about money that brings out the best episodes in Gumball, huh? The Check is what happens when you tempt the Watersons with a $5,000 check. So Louie tries to get on the good side of his grandchildren by handing them a little bit of money as a reward. And this bank note is for a whopping $5,000. And once all the family finds this out, it's a race to the bank. Everyone's trying to yoink this check before the others do and get to the bank quickly, which leads to this chase scene in Invisible Cars. Who knew that an invisible car chase would go harder than most actual car chases? This episode has a ton of jokes that hit me so hard now. I don't even know if I understood them when I was little. Hi, fellow Americans. I think we all know where this is going, so let's just skip to the end. No, like the goofy style of this chase scene and the TV gag from Darwin were so funny when all the kids were daydreaming about what they do with the money. Only in the end, just to just to be completely scammed. I, I, I love it. You love to see it. People being greeting over money and getting scammed for it. That's the best. Episode 7, the pest. Anais has been training for days on end to finally put an end to this little pest in her life called Billy. So in the episode, the egg last season is when Anais originally met Billy. And then they thought they'd be friends, but they realized that they were too intelligent and too snooty and sarcastic for each other so they kind of separated out a little bit but little billy here is kind of an incel he will not let up on either making fun of a nice or following her wherever she goes so the boys set out to stop billy from bullying their little sister well we actually figure out that he's doing that thing that little kids do when they have crushes on girls and that's bullying them billy had a crush on the nice since the day he met her and a nice didn't feel the same I still see your shadows in which turned him into a sad little villain but thanks to miss simeon and gumball and everyone now realizes how dumb this is and how you shouldn't beat yourself up just because one girl does doesn't like you. Also this. You don't understand. I'm the one who's getting picked on. Then forget everything I said. Let's go. Let's go. Dragon Ball is 100% canon in Gumball. It's had two back-to-back -back references now. I wonder if Gumball could beat Frieza. Can we get like a death battle on that, please? Number eight, the sale. Well, guys, I'm sorry to say it, but this, this is the end. Mr. Robinson is moving away. Now, this is an incredible day for Mr. Robinson as he doesn't have to deal with Gumball and Darwin anymore. But to them, to them, this is possibly the most devastating thing that could have ever happened to the two. So yeah, Mr. Robinson is about to sell his house to high paying individuals because they're the only ones that would even accept this house in this kind of neighborhood. But once Gumball and Darwin figure this out, all they have to do is come up with schemes and plans to get these vegetables away from their favorite guy's house. And in my opinion, there has not been a single Mr. Robinson episode so far that has missed. Don't get me wrong, okay? The boys are a little bit annoying and really, really creepy with their love for this middle-aged man that clearly doesn't love him back. But I think some of the best humor comes from these episodes as these two opposite personalities and their sheer absurd love just makes it makes them clash and hit even harder. And, and Gummel and Darwin's attempts to make the house look creepy and unpurchasable was, oh, it was, it was so fun to watch. Number nine, the gift. Well known fact around Elmore that Masami, the cloud girl, is rich as hell. Her mom, famous businesswoman. Her dad owns the rainbow factory. So every year it's Masami's birthday. Everyone's worried and speeding around to get her the perfect gift. But secretly, Masami doesn't even want a gift. She just wants someone to spend her birthday with that's not automatically looking for the most expensive or the most extravagant gift to give her. We realize the best gift that someone could give her is quality time with friends. So Gummo and Darwin think of the perfect idea to lock her in their basement, which promptly lights on fire and also starts to flood. And they need to try their best to break out before the police get here because they accidentally sent their dad a ransom note. <laughs> Sorry. No, you didn't. Well, I'll say it now. Sorry. 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 Apology not accepted. And you just sent this to my dad. It was really bad. 
This is the debut of Masami's dad, and I really like Masami's parents' designs. We haven't gotten to see her mom yet. That's later in the season, but you will see as well why her mom will immediately catch your eye. But I've also noticed that episodes about supporting characters have gotten way better since I started in season two, where now we know a lot more about Masami's character and personality more than just being a rich cloud girl with a hard on for balloons. Hey, but speaking of balloons, Alan's fourth wall break trying to tell us the viewer that about the beauty of life while we try to drift away quickly was so good. Love is the butterflies in your stomach. Love is that rush you feel when you, uh, that rush you feel when you, hey, that rush you feel for knowing that there is more to this. Oh, come on. I love fourth wall breaks, man. They're like my favorite types of jokes in cartoons. Chowder is still one of my favorite shows. If I ever do this type of video again, it'll definitely be about chowder. But the video gamey style chase scene to get to the painting to get Masami, then the Mick Graves reference. I thought that was a pretty good sequence. And Masami, you know what? Cute character. Third favorite girl. I'm calling it. She on my top five list. Episode 10, the parking. Relatable episode alert. You know when you're parking in a crowded location and it seems like the universe is just against you. Everyone's taking their spots before you. You gotta drive for hours an hour so you can spend 30 minutes in this store. But this time, there is something completely wrong. The Watersons travel throughout the whole of Elmore, battling other drivers to finally find their spot to where they can go inside. They will park literally anywhere. In an alleyway, in a woman, <laughs> in a movie. And at the end, they have to battle for the final parking spot against these other cars that are hiding away like tigers waiting for their prey. And it's a really creative gumball sort of way of presenting this sort of dilemma. Also, I found some more goofy mistakes in this episode. Look at the car in this scene. Right, right. And then look at the car in the next scene. One minute, Nicole's driving, and then they flip around. Richard's driving, bro. It's just, they're playing a game of Twister in there. And at the end, they end up parking in front of their house after everything. Episode 11, The Routine. Another Richard episode, but in my opinion, it's got to be one of the best. Where Richard has to go to the grocery store, and we see Richard's adventure from his perspective. And it turns it into this fantasy medieval epic, where Richard and his steed, Cartax, are going off to the forbidden lands to get mayo. Dude, it's so good when Richard is more than just a lazy father who's loud. His imagination and positivity in situations like this is so underused. Half the time you see him, he just says a dumb quip or just gets yelled at by Nicole. But I love the way that he sees the world and the love that he has for fantasy. I feel like that's when he's at his best. And also a weird thing about Gumball, the cultural references. There are references to movies in here from 1984. I just want to say I love how the creators of Gumball weave in little references to what the things they might have saw in their childhood into this version, into this show, into other people's childhoods. Very good stuff. Very good stuff. Number 12, The Upgrade. The boys see an ad, the boys, the boys see an ad for a company that seems eerily close to a real life tech giant. We've seen the truth. And the truth is the unknown. Let me introduce our new Bobbit system. No references here. And after seeing this ad, they see that Bobbert could get a new upgrade to his system with a ton of new features. Look, you know we love you just the way you are, but we feel like we could love you more if you were better. System alert, self-esteem file corrupted, moving file to trash, system status, S-A-D. What does that stand for? Sad. But they do take Bobber and start shoving him full of upgrades until they all start to malfunction and they need to get him fixed. So they take Bobber to the Bobber store and they realize that they're being completely scammed. Can you please downgrade our Bobber? Well, no, you see, our philosophy at Bobber's store is to focus on our vision on the ascent to perfection and break away from the past. Mean. It means no. Just fix them, okay? Let me take a look. Hey, Jaden. Oh, hey, Cody. Nice shirt. And here we are. Where's our bobber? Oh, he's been sent back to our factory with the rest of our products that we purposefully designed to fail so that your force. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the product. Hi, I'm Jaden. I'll be your new service specialist. But after taking Bobbert away, they give him a whole new replacement, which turns out to be a better Bobbert. But they do want their old friend back. But it's too late as he's being shipped to a whole nother country. And they have to save him by getting him out of a plain storage container. And by the time they get him and he barely comes back to life and saves Gumball, the whole message about the episode is you should be happy with yourselves and your friends and you should change for no one. Blah, 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 blah. Nah, 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 for real. I do like the message. You don't always need the newest, most expensive thing to be happy. Just upgrade your tech when you feel like it and don't feel pressure. Number 13, the comic. A comic about the incredible hero, Laserheart, has hit Elmore. Written by the fan fiction specialist, Sarah. This comic book is based around Gumball because who else would she base it on? And Gumball is so stoked about being a superhero that he wants to give up real life and love up to his superhero counterpart. To Murphy. No, wait, back up a bit. All right, cool. Where is the ball? I don't know. Where is the ball? Oh, 
Lindsay lost it. I swear. Swear to me. I just did. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. But then there's a reality check where after going around trying to be superheroes, trying to save the day and failing, Gumball or Laserheart gets into a real life robbery. Give me my wallet. Uh, sure. Where is it? In your pocket. What? Laserheart, do something. After being confronted with real crime and doing literally nothing, he knows that maybe he should give up trying to be a superhero. But to make them feel better, Sarah rewrites their story to make it fit with themselves now. And how instead of being superheroes, all they can do is be the best selves that they can be. And how the power of optimism takes you a long way. And man, this comic sucks. It's got that cliche with the power of friendship ending. But nah, actually, this is so well made. I love this art style and I don't even read comics. And Sarah really came through here with the best of her character, which is her creativity and her willingness to help the boys at any moment. And cool references to multiple heroes and movies that are in this. That was I. Number four the romantic <gasps> penny 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 you get to see more of penny's transformation powers in this episode as she goes from form to form to form looking for a treasure hunt that gumball set up for her okay you see how this all started is that gumball was texting penny right and when penny was done having this text conversation penny only sent him one hard eyes emoji instead of the normal three this is bad news as gumball sees it so he hatches a plan to remind penny of their love just in case she lost it uh this is kind of insane because the type of stuff he puts penny through here is goddamn brutal brutal over one text message and she even addresses that at the end now i try not to be biased with this episode right because i love penny's character especially now and her and gumball's chemistry cannot be topped by anyone other than him and darwin's Mwah. the jokes are hitting a new art style is being featured for the forest monsters making the atmosphere of this forest that penny goes into all the more mysterious and dark and jagged and one other thing that makes gumball and penny episodes so good is that we don't really get them often they just kind of pop up rarely now like a little treat and it always surpasses the norms of the show i feel like if we got episodes like these all the time well, I'd be happy. But no, we'd recognize the pattern eventually and their interactions might start to get stale. But honestly, I wouldn't be too opposed to more Penny. Give me, give me the Penny spinoff. Just, to, just, to, just to make the show. Number 15, the uploads. This entire episode is just 11 minutes of parroting old 2000s and 2010 internet humor. And, you know, to be honest, I don't really mind it. I just need one, man. Just one video. Just let me hit one. No, you end up disappearing down the Elmore stream hole. There's no knowing how many precious hours you lose watching idiotic online videos. Now slowly walk away from the computer. Now turn around nice and easy. <laughs> too much to live for. You got family, right? You got friends, yeah? You got a girlfriend, too. Then why waste your life on life like this? I got too far. It's too late for me. It's too late. It is never too late to choose life. You got too much to live for. Drop the mouth. Drop the mouth. Drop it. Drop it now. Okay. Okay. How Gumball and Darwin get sucked back after trying to leave the computer like in season two. How this YouTube poop actually looks like a YouTube poop in internet brain rot. All that's okay. The one thing that really got me laughing here was this ad of them clicking on the guy. You can't square the circle. You can only run. Run back to you. Back to me. Back to us. Outside of everything. I don't know what. Inside that's, of it, nothing. Something about this is just right but the saxophone dog alan doing the als ice bucket challenge and richard giving us a very helpful tutorial during this game i found was part of my computer it's not as good as minesweeper or solitaire but it's worth a shot okay it's called calculator um you take your character and you pick up a pair of binoculars and you spot the treasure marked by the x obviously <laughs> But be careful, because as soon as you get the treasure, there's this snake thing. But it's okay, because you can pick up the axe, or the bow, or the arrow, and kill it. Then see what you've got. Hey, I got a new high score! One criticism I have is that there's no female characters, but there's no male characters either, so it's okay, I guess. Um, there's a couple of little glitches with certain commands, like if I try to use the arrow with the balloon, see what happens. 
so many popular gumball memes have sprouted from this one episode and it's a classic number 16 the apprentice so penny's dad patrick is heading in for this big business interview that could mean big things if he succeeds but unfortunately gumball is gumball and he butts in gumball really wants to connect with penny's dad and he really wants approval so he could finally date his daughter you know he wants he breaks into his car he busts in between his thighs he does I should have worded that better. And we get to see Patrick get tortured as Gumball messes with him all the way up to the top floor of the building where he meets the boss. There's a point where Gumball's playing with his DNA in the elevator and just turns into this el Eldrick beast for a second. But as Patrick is trying to talk to the boss, Gumball keeps on messing around and it actually ends up going a little bit better for him than he expected. So the boss invites Patrick and Gumball to play a round of golf. And since this golf game is the thing that their whole business deal is staked on, Patrick needs to win, so Gumball helps him cheat. Although things go awry quick as when Gumball moves to the side when Patrick doesn't want him to. What? The ball's on the left? No! Don't go to the left! I am on the left! Go to your left! Ha ha ha! He's gonna get hit by the ball as a consequence of this misunderstanding! And it made a coconut sound! He gets absolutely folded and then everything starts looking a little bit weird to gumball from this point on it is at this point where you start to question whether he got hit in the head with a golf ball or molly Gumball trips out hard and it's because of this magical drugged up golf ball that he figures out that the boss was planning something evil the entire time so he actually has to stop cheating and let the boss win the game so he could save Patrick from a bad deal until nope Gumball was laid out the whole episode it was all a hallucination it was all the dream oh, and Patrick actually have a really good chemistry in my opinion I think Patrick's a really likable character he's always been this mean dad but he's never been outright just horrible you know you he has his own traits that you can relate to and we even see a moment of vulnerability from him in the beginning when he's scared to go into the interview but bro fuck the characters the animation i don't do drugs right i don't do drugs but i have had my fair share of flintstone gummies and i can say that this this looks pretty accurate to what i see and also seeing the world crumble around gumball and all these different bits throughout the episode it was really good pretty good one good one bro number 17 the hug ladies and gentlemen i would like to introduce you all to the most suspect moment in gumball history i can't tell if he's asleep he's got no eyes do i have to make conversation oh thank goodness i can finally relax <sighs> Okay, okay, okay. I'll just move his hand very slowly. What the? Uh, oh, man! Okay. Oh, bro, I couldn't tell whether I loved or hated this one. So Gumball gets into an awkward situation where he first meets this hot dog guy and he gives the hot dog guy a hug in an attempt to be unpredictable. And that starts up their awkward relationship where they feel like they need to show affection to each other every single time they're in each other's sight. And it gets extremely carried away. Way too carried away. Who storyboarded this? Who, who did this? Who did it? They both realize they hate this and they need to get away from each other. So they have to end the friendship forcefully. Uh, Gumball is way too good at making cringe awkward stuff. I wanted to close the tab multiple times, but I'm gonna be honest. I also wanted to laugh. This was 100% all Darwin's fault, but seeing Gumball get revenge at the end, making him go hug Darwin, um, I was still processing this. The hug has adult jokes and social commentary that scores the episode pretty high because it's one of the most memorable episodes in Gumball. Number 18, The Wicked. Mrs. Margaret Robinson, the one wife of Mr. Robinson, who's been seen throughout the series, but never really had an episode dedicated to her. Finally, she gets that. And that is until now where we find out that she is nothing but a pure evil 
puppet piece of trash. Someone who wants nothing more than pain and suffering and heartache and death and destruction. And none of that is hyperbole. She thrives off negativity. She'll do anything bad to animals, to babies. She'll literally watch a kid choke as she goes into her house, smiling at Darwin as he choked out on a small toy. And it was at that point where they realized they needed to get revenge. So the boys attempt to get her arrested. They actually set up this entire plan, leaving the keys in their mom's car. And basically this is supposed to lure her in to maybe steal the keys and keep them. And once she takes the keys out and steals them, they'll take a picture of her and send it to the police. So let's see how it plays out. <laughs> All right, so it looks like they grossly underestimated how evil she is. Ms. Robinson out here straight bleeding on him. And even after dodging and weaving and being reported as a criminal, she escapes the police. And after all this bullshit, you'd think that she'd at least get some form of punishment. Oh. Oh. Earlier in this episode, I didn't really mention it, but there was a whole section of it, the whole first half, where Darwin refused to take any revenge on Miss Margaret. Because, you know, Darwin's just too nice and there's no one in this world that could be evil. Despite him seeing time and time again that people could definitely be evil. At the beginning, it just seemed like too much even for him. But I was very satisfied with the ending. And I'm that, pretty sure that's what they were going for. They, they had like this huge build up all to the final ending where Mrs. Robinson just gets absolutely folded, dead, done for, Dudensky. And that's how you get an easy good score out of me episode 19 the traitor here we see gumball being a douche alan being perfect and gumball being a douche again and that's every interaction they've ever had so gumball spends his time tidying up the house after he invites alan to come over to his place as an apology for how mean he's been to alan in the past but then last second alan dodges his invitation and says he can't come over because his mom is going to the hospital to where after seeing this text he also sees on elmore plus that alan is hanging out with his mom right outside of his house and now he thinks alan lied through his teeth and he starts stalking Talking Alan throughout the day and forces Darwin to come with him so he can get revenge. I wasn't really feeling this episode much on the first watch because, you know, the whole Alan being perfect and Gumball hating him and wanting to kill him thing kind of got old for me. It's just not really one of my favorite running gags. And I understand it's to accentuate both of the characters' traits and comedy, them being so different from each other. But I think it's a little bit formulaic and samey. But I started coming around to this one once it got to the surgery scene. You see, Alan's mom did actually need to go to the hospital. But Alan spent the whole day with her right beforehand because this operation is kind of scary where he'll be transporting his kidney into his mom as she needs a new one so to make it up to him gumball and darwin decide to take upon themselves and do the surgery since the surgeon actually got knocked out it gets so silly because all of alan's insides are invisible and made of air there flatulent transplant okay oh not okay let me look oh you're right all his organs are made of air just grab anything it'll probably be the flatulent uh, no. It's all invisible. How are we supposed to do this operation? Ah! He's gushing air everywhere! Ah! What's going on here? I think the anesthetic's worn off. How can you tell? My insides are pouring out! What do we do? What do we do? Okay, now look for a flatulum. And that ending really set this episode apart from the other Alan and Gumball episodes, and it made the episode look more original, and it made me like it more. Nice how-to basic reference, though. <laughs> Episode 20, The Origins. What we do here is go back, 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 back. We go back in time to see when Richard and Nicole were younger and Gumball was nothing but a little baby boy. Oh my God. But the parents thought Gumball would just be this a little adorable ball of joy. It turns out pretty quickly that that isn't the case and we see him become a little demon spawn that can't sit still. No matter what they do, nothing will work. So the parents get him a little pet fish who he names Darwin, who actually keeps his attention. And the two actually go on to grow a happy, loving French. Sweet chatty on. 
Yeah, so Darwin, the Darwin we know wasn't the first Darwin, to the point where Richard buys so many goldfish from the pet store that he has to outsource and go find another goldfish to be the replacement for Darwin. And thankfully, he gets yoinked into a magical van by a stranger. In this van, it will always be a ton of magical items that don't make sense in reality, which is why this van is called the Awesome Store. And it's in this van where he finally spots what he needs, a purchase who we'd come to know as Darwin. Oh, baby Darwin. And once I first meet, it's quickly that Gumball realizes that him and this Darwin connect on a whole different level than the other ones. Gumball. And since Gumball is so stoked, he wants to show his parents and they play a little game while he leaves. Basically, Gumball instructs Darwin to just sit still, unmoving whatsoever and upside down. And when Richard sees it, he mistakes him to have the same fate as all the rest of the Darwin. So he's about to give him the same fate until Gumball realizes. But it's okay, because Darwin hasn't stopped moving. I feel like I should be worried about something, but I don't know what. Nope, still don't get it. Nope. Don't move a muscle until I say so. Say so. Say so. <gasps> That's such a good bit. I love that. It's the last minute where Gumball gets there and saves Darwin after they're about to flush him. And unlike the rest, he saves last minute. Darwin! Sorry, I thought he was there. I sleep and ready to go to a magic fish wonder day. He knows. <sighs> and everything's all hunky dory right there. Get it, Dory? Cause the Dory's like from Finding Nemo. Welcome to the water, since Darwin. Okay, everybody, say cheese in three, two. Cheese! <laughs> Darwin fucking dies. No, I hate to be continued. Oh man, but this was a really good episode, so I'm not really mad. We'll start seeing this more later in the series, but a ton of the Richard and Nicole episodes, especially about them being younger, get a whole lot of high praise from fans, and I can see why. They all seem to be more solid and polished and somewhat more beautiful than all the rest of the episodes in Gumball, as it really humanizes these two, defines their love, and defines how the whole amazing world of Gumball started. But the end of the episode here does something great and builds up to the next. Episode 21, The Origins Part 2, baby. Got an all-star here. It is not until now that an episode has made me tear up, laugh, and genuinely so appreciative of the show. We pick up where Darwin gets flushed down the toilet and goes on a massive journey to reunite with Gumball. Also, we figure out that their toilets get flushed straight into the ocean, which is goddamn disgusting. And Darwin makes an attempt to make it farther than any of his fish brethren have ever made it before and traverse land by himself. And it's with the power of friendship that he can do this, he grows lungs. Now, right, this dude Darwin is dead. Like, basically dead multiple times throughout this episode. But thanks to the power of their love for each other, he gets lungs, food, legs. And I know that might sound sound, you know, dumb and lazy, but hey, he's a magical fish that got bought from a van. He can just do these things, okay? After seeing Darwin struggle, and he did indeed struggle, this show is actually really good at drawing pain. Then only for him to get mistreated and mistreated and missing his goal again and again, and then seeing him realize Gumball might have finally gave up on him. for them to reunite and have that happy ending. Not to mention some of the animation and jokes in this were so good. When I grow up, I want to be a lawyer like you, father. Hello! Ah, uh, talking dog! dog. <laughs> and it made this anomaly of the episode where it had a perfect balance between the serious and the non-serious at the exact perfect times. One of the best of the season for sure, but unfortunately, we gotta follow one of the best with one of the worst. Why does this always happen? Episode 22, The Girlfriend. Was way more time than we needed. I need a sweetheart. I 
wasn't sure before watching this. I felt like that claim about Jamie being the center of a ton of bad episodes was kind of harsh, but now I'm pretty much 100% sure with my claim that Jamie is one of the single worst characters in Gumball at this point. Here we see the school bully Jamie going through her usual charade by taking people, eating them, bullying them, until she gets kind of shell-shocked and confused when she sees Alan and Carmen be so close. Alan and Carmen are dating, and she's never experienced anything like that, and she wants to for herself. And the only person that stuck around for her to ask that was Darwin. Okay, the upsides of this episode are a small few, but they're worth mentioning. Jamie herself isn't entirely awful. She has some jokes at land, and she isn't a completely one-dimensional bully. Like, they've actually upgraded her personality a tiny bit. But to be honest, watching this one, I kind of wish she stayed one-dimensional. This was so annoying to sit through. The main problem here is that this relationship is awful and obviously doesn't work. Jamie doesn't know how to actually love and it's affecting people around him negatively, but Darwin refuses to speak out about it because he's scared of what will happen to him if he tries. And not to mention, he completely doubts Gumbo when he's trying to help him. Now, not once does he say no, not once does he try to refuse her, not once does he feel like he has the power to actually speak for himself. Now, this is a real thing that people go through when in toxic relationships. I understand what they're going for here, but the ending where Darwin just gets beat up and then Gumball getting the last laugh just wasn't really satisfying for what we just saw and went through. You know how the origins had this sort of drawn out story that ended and crescendoed into something great? We'll take that same thing, get rid of the ending, and throw in a quick little not that funny ending with a dumb quip and cutting it off right there. You know, dude, all you had to do was keep your mouth shut and say nothing. All Gumball episodes are like 12, 11 minutes. This one felt like 30 just because of how drawn out it felt. Because of certain jokes like these two sitting in silence for 15 seconds. Or Richard making funny faces and doing goofy noises for 30 seconds. Thanks. The less interaction with her, the better. Who is she? Your future daughter-in-law. Really? Darwin! m m m but yeah, it's just annoying to watch Darwin be too afraid to speak up, end up not speaking up, and even still getting hurt even when he got help from a friend. And Gumball's message at the end was just to stay quiet and deal with it. I wouldn't be mad if I never watched this again. Episode 23, The Advice. Sad Mr. Small is sad. Why? Well, because children, or as all the teachers put it, because they're all struggling to keep up being teachers, to keep up the mindset of teaching kids and trying to be happy when kids are just the worst. Mr. Small's dreams of being the greatest teacher and teaching these young minds of the world how to solve cancer or something is not coming true. So Gumbo and Darwin decide to help him out by actually listening to him and taking some of his advice so he can feel like a good teacher again. They end up taking most of his advice way too goddamn literally to the point where they take it so literally that uh, all right hear me out here this is gonna sound all over the place but this happened after they're told to follow their dreams darwin remembers a dream that he had where gumball was a naked leprechaun he had on cake shoes in the classroom flooding with water with abraham lincoln the goat running around who then busts out of the room and starts terrorizing the school and mr smalls ends up singing the ending song where he talks about the magic of teaching children and listening to your heart mr small you had good intentions but bro you ruined the entire place man i cannot forgive you this was a pretty all right episode at 24 the signal something weird happening in Elmore as of late. Look, it seems like everyone's on 500 ping. ping. They got that McDonald's Wi-Fi. What do you think? No, I think it's a bit... You're right, too desperate for attention. How about this? Yeah, that all makes you look... Yeah, too Canadian. I really like this one, but do you think it makes me look like I have a fat head? I, uh... <laughs> my feelings just tell me and this sort of lag almost ruins gumball and darwin's friendships as they can't really understand each other and everything seems to be going awry once this world lag really starts to kick in and the boys jump around from place to place but after reconnecting and bouncing around for a while they realize that the tv signal they watch the tv and see this news guy talk about how the signal was breaking and if anyone experienced any lag that was why very strange how that had an effect in the real world maybe we'll find out why in another episode episode episode, episode. oops you have to 
to put the CD. Number 25, the parasite. So as we all know, Anais is socially awkward as hell. And she needs to make a new friend until she actually ends up meeting someone that really likes her. The way the two act around each other start to make the boys think that it's maybe less of a friendship and more of a parasitic relationship. Anais and this random girl that popped up are so connected with each other that they even start finishing each other's sentences. So the boys have to step in and separate their sister from this from this parasite. Hey Anais, we need to talk. What about? Dear Diary, today I made a wretched friend who takes advantage of me and deserves to have objects thrown in her face. Oh, what was that for? That was for reading my diary. Oh. And that was for using my voice without permission. And that's for trying to throw things at my friend. And that's for worrying about me. First, she uses you to get stuff. Then when you think you guys are friends, she takes over your mind, attaches herself to your body, and before you know it, she's turned you into a fungus thingy so she can release her spores, contaminate more people, and destroy civilization as we know it. I stole that last part from a zombie video game. Look, for once I get to hang out with someone who gives me my own problems, rather than someone who makes me fix theirs. Who's that? Sounds awful. You! Please don't ruin this for me! Follow her! So they bring her to the school nurse, who, th who then goes on to confirm that it's actually not the duck girl, but it's Anais, who was the actual social parasite all along. Anais is such a cute character, man. I wish she was in more episodes as of recent. Here we see a bit more of her dark side instead of her smarmy side, where we see her actually struggle with something that other people struggle with. Instead of just being incredibly smart all the time, it really grounds a character that would otherwise be like way less interesting if that's all she was and just good at everything. Solid episode, but with a lot of really disturbing imagery for some reason. Like what kind of resonance? an evil shit is this. Number 26, the love. How do you teach an object that cannot love about love? It's a question posed to the boys when Bobbert wants to know what is love. We then get this cute song along with the compilation of different types of love in Elmore. Warning, circular reference detected. I love my boyfriend. I love my toys. I love my mother. And I love making noise. I love my television. Darling, I love you. say it again. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this dumbass shit again. This is a comfort episode for me. No annoying characters, no stretch plots, not that much dialogue, just a bunch of funny visual gags one after the other with a wholesome ending and a wholesome message. I could get down with more episodes like this because even though there's not much substance to them and not much to really review, I still appreciate how easy it is to watch and enjoy. Number 27, the awkwardness. Oh, guess who's back? Hot dog guy, baby. And this time, it's even gayer. Gumball gets into more shenanigans with the hot dog guy as they have to figure out how to avoid each other once and for all. Think of the last interaction they had, but multiply the awkwardness times 10. I think it was solid to continue the story, but I still think, you know, the first episode was better. So I'm gonna put it below that one, but I still, th I still think they're both solid. <sighs> Number 28, The Nest. So, bro, do you remember that evil snapping turtle from season two? So, um, I've been corrected. I checked the comments, and you guys said that it uh, that is not a snapping turtle, but in fact, a soft shell turtle. I apologize to the turtle community. I made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment. I don't expect to be forgiven. All right, well, guess what? She's back, and she brought company, baby. Gumball literally doing the Henry Stickman distraction dance. It turns out that the evil snapping turtle that Richard bought back in season two was actually pregnant and gave birth to tons of her young in a nest below the Waterson's house. And people have been going missing thing ever since these eggs have started to pop up. And why is that? Well, because once these eggs hatch, her babies need food. And once it actually starts happening, these tiny little demon offspring pop out to ravage Elmore. It's now that the family realizes that they have to save the town. So they track down the mama turtle and use her to lure them away back into the ocean where they belong. There was something that felt different about this episode in a really refreshing and good way. It felt like there was never a slow moment. It was just action, 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 followed by rapid fire joke after serious moment, after rapid fire 
crack joke. Some really good ones might add as well, like the news bit, and they even gave us this gift. Also, I don't really know how to describe it, but I really like how this episode looks. The vibe of it is so cinematic and atmospheric. It feels like they put a lot more focus on the colors and the different settings throughout this to make it more dark and misty and more epic. This is a great one. And side note, a cool thing I found, it, it's another animation error all by myself. Here on the couch, you can see Nicole's missing whiskers. I hope whoever forgot to draw those whiskers gets fired. Number 29, the points. Video game references, baby, let's go. Come on, Darwin, get into this new game and so does Tobias. And Tobias being rich, he spends a whole ton of money into this game and turns into an absolute whale. Uh, to explain, a whale is someone who spends a shit ton of money on in-game currency. And Tobias goes full on league player. Since the game that they're all loving and playing is pay to win, the boys actually were really begging Tobias to give them some of his points so they can actually get somewhere in this game. And Tobias makes them do a bunch of chores for him in exchange for his special currency. But um, it's by this end point that the boys realize that Tobias had been scamming them the entire time because Tobias bucks aren't a thing that exists. And they threaten to tell his father about the money he's been spending. They go into this epic imaginary battle with pixel guns and pixel weapons and halo references and all the all the whiz. Think you can outrun me? Well, try to outrun my portal gun. Darn, missed it. Gotta cycle through again. Tobias has really grown as a character so much that he's not incredibly annoying every time he shows up on screen anymore. You know, now he actually has a reason to do certain things instead of just being a douche. Very tasteful with all the references. Number 30, the bus. Rocky takes the kids on a detour in the school bus and uh-oh, uh-oh, oh no. Good afternoon, children. My name is Mr. Brown, this is Mr. Pink, Mr. Rainbow, and Mr. White. My name is Walter Hartwell White. I live at 308 Negra Arroyo Lane, Albuquerque, New Mexico. The bus actually gets hijacked by a group of criminals that threaten to blow up the kids. Um, and Gumball figures out immediately that it's actually just Principal Brown and a few of their parents in disguises. In that suitcase, um, that that's a that's a real bomb though. And someone ended up calling the police because trapping a bunch of kids on a bus, whether you're a teacher teaching them a lesson or not, it's kind of not okay. And this situation that was set up to be fake turns really quick into an actual hostage situation where the parents actually get ransom money for the kids. But who put the bomb in the suitcase? Because none of the parents remember putting an actual bomb on the bus. They would never do that, right? Who would be Dr. Wrecker, motherfucker. Gumball's nemesis Rob tries to take him down once and for all in this huge final battle, and he's not even afraid to take the rest of the class with him. And Rob tries to steal the money as the battle gets taken outside the bus, the battle bus, if you will. And this fight transitions from there to a fight on a plane wing like it's Mission Impossible, until Rob unfortunately snatches the briefcase and runs away. And it seems like at this point, he wins. Or does he? One thing left to say. You are. I know, I know. I'm wrecked. I was gonna say you're under arrest. Come on, man. Did you really think that this wouldn't have a happy ending? Gumball just like saved the day right there. Solid fun and a little place to insert more Rob trying to be evil, which we'll definitely see more of later. Episode 31, the night. Dreams are weird. Places of imagination where our brains express thoughts in a visual way that don't make any sense to our reality. And you know how our dreams are weird? Imagine how weird dreams will get in the world of Gumball. And that's basically the point of this episode as we see many of our characters' dreams as we go into them while they go to sleep. While some of them are fitting. Hey, Carmen, what's up? <gasps> Dude, I can talk. I can communicate again. Guys, guys, let's have a conversation right now. No, 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 that's not fair. Some of them are also a bit downright weird goofy and um horrifying a little bit for example the daisy dream here would you like some more anise oh look at you you're all dirty it's bath time still dirty you're my best friend anise do you like me too Never. That 
my dream. I don't think I'm ever gonna recover from seeing Daisy like that. But I think my favorite dreams have to be the sussy fourth wall break, where it's revealed to us that she is literally nothing but a chin. <laughs> And also the Richard dream, where as him and Nicole are sleeping, while Nicole's being like drowned underneath Richard's sweat, he's imagining himself as a bun. I'm a bun, I'm a bun, I'm a tasty, tasty bun to be baked and kneaded. Oh, how fun, you can have me with breakfast, have me with brunch, you can have me with your dinner, you can have me with your lunch. Nice. Episode 32, The Misunderstanding. When Gumball ends up misunderstanding Penny in the morning when she invites him to a dinner date, but not at a date at dinner time, it's a date at a place called dinner. This is just bad advertising. Gumball then has to maneuver his way to the mall, meet up with Penny, have their lunch date, and make it there on time. But he ends up going through the exact same route reason why he was late in the first place everyone is misunderstanding him everything he tells the people comes out rude or he ends up inviting people where he doesn't want to invite them it all culminates in this ending of a bunch of characters interacting with gumball that he never wanted to in the first place when he just wanted to go on a date he gets their family's car crash he insults someone's mom he ends up going on a date with this really shady homeless dude this episode was pretty goddamn creative in my opinion i mean it had penny so it's automatically like a tier you need to pay and get your prize for the auction Fine, what's the prize? A kiss! Okay, you know what, whatever. On the cheek, from Miss Elmore, comes with a dinner. <laughs> Other than her, a lot of the jokes they squeezed in with Gumball, like messing with people around the neighborhood, was really funny to see. Number 33, The Roots. So as we were all reminded in the origins, uh, Darwin was adopted by the Watersons. And you know, after they go to a pet shop to buy Darwin a bigger cage, they see him wallowing over looking at the fish. Be wait, wait a minute, there's this bit. Uh, mom? I know, sweetie. Don't think about it too much. Bro, I said so they want to bring a presentation to their parents to, on why they should possibly get up an animal, which is kind of weird since they, they are animals. Yo, they addressed it. That is weird as hell. Don't think about it too much. But yeah, the family sees Darwin looking longingly at these fish in this tank and think that maybe Darwin would want to experience the fish life and live out in the ocean where he'd be more free and could connect with his true people. The family gets so depressed when they think Darwin is going to leave them. It's kind of like the genius from season one, but to the extreme where they're so immersed in this illusion that Darwin isn't happy that they basically kidnap him and sacrifice him to the ocean. And Darwin basically has to come all the way back to them after they left him out by the sea. But you know what I say though? Crazy water sins are the best water sins. I'll keep saying that. I love when they match each other's energy and I think this episode played off well. <laughs> <laughs> with this fish and adopted humor. This episode is so sick, I got COVID. Number 34, The Blame. Gotta love some gumball social commentary. The stuck up orange parent, Felicity, is back and she has something to say after her son, Billy, has been exposed to the world of video gaming. And because her sweet baby boy got a little bit too immersed in his first video game experience and all this digital filth, she wants to put a stop to it. So she pulls a whole Ted Cruz and blames violence on video games. Mrs. Param gives gumball three lives or three chances to prove why video games aren't violent and bad for children. Every example he goes to doesn't prove his point at all. Now, safety first, dear little brother. Of course, dear big brother. The wrist strap. What was I thinking? <coughs> Sorry, no hand at the end of the wrist. Come on, Anise. We can't lose to these slugs. Anise, take the shot. <coughs> ah, come on. Uh, now, now, mother. It's only a game. After losing all of his lives, Felicity ends up winning and banning all video games. So the kids come up with this idea to prove to Felicity and all the rest of the parents that books can be just as violent, if not more violent, than video games. And they have a song to prove why. Juke, hit it! It's a sports, 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 cover to cover, bow with a spine, run to your mother, but books are the same. Every story to video games, they're just as gory. Offense and ventures by Mark Twain, all these books are just me insane, so who should really get the blame? Now this song is okay, and this whole episode premise is okay. I do like the little animation when Billy finds out what video gaming is for the first time. And the parents' reactions are goofy, but it's actually just reality how this is some people react to video games and fiction. It's that tasteful gumball social commentary where they hit the nail on the head, baby. Number 35, the slap. And our whistle. This, 
This is the type of humor that makes me love this show. It's just so awkward and so goddamn absurd that it just surprises you with how dumb it is. So Tobias starts this weird new handshake with the dudes where after he high fives someone, he gives their butt a little, a little smack, you know, like it's football. Well, he gives these sort of butt smack high fives to everyone except for Gumball. And it's not that Gumball wants his ass smacked, it's just he wants to feel included. <laughs> Throughout this entire episode, we just watch Gumball be this entire freak seven days a week. He even ends up coming up with this entire ruse to lure Tobias onto the roof so we would have no other choice but to slap his ass eventually. I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't really enjoying this episode too much at this roof section or anything in the second half here. I think it started after this song that Gumball sang about wanting his ass smacked and how oh, what is it's my it's my booty not good enough i feel i have a duty to defend my sad behind it's not the finest booty but it has feelings so do i i just needed someone here who would gently touch my rear to be friendly to be fair to respect my dairy I'll just give up and cry. My lonely backside and I. I was hella uncomfortable that entire time, I'm not gonna lie. But the idea in this wacky sort of humor playing throughout the whole like first half and the whole idea around this is so just goofy. That's the only thing I really like about it. It really made me laugh originally, but I didn't really, I wasn't really feeling the rest of the episode. Number 36, The Detective. And nice as Daisy Plushy gets murdered in a freak accident, and she needs to use her smart detective skills to track down exactly what happened to her. After that episode the night, I would let Daisy stay dead, but you know, she doesn't know about Daisy's dreams yet. So nice goes searching around for Daisy stuffing and figure out who did this to her. Eventually, she catches up to the boys and realizes that they destroyed Daisy on a super, sh like, sugar binge. There was enough sugar in that bowl to turn their brains to jelly. caught in the middle of their sugar binge. And soon after consuming so much of the sugary cereal, the boys start to look a little bit like crack addicts. And once Daisy gets thrown away by Darwin trying to hide the evidence, Anais needs to get her back, so she follows the dump truck. Anais episodes are few and far between, but I'd say compared to the others, this is somewhat of a uh, filler one. I like the drug addict jokes and the ending, but compared to the others, this one felt more short and quick, like a little quick bit that they can make based around a detective episode, since they haven't really made a noir episode yet, and this is the closest we'll get. Episode 37, The Fury. The episode that many non-Gumball fans know as, oh, the anime one, is a perfect, creative, hilarious showing of Nicole's character. Okay, right, so Nicole, growing up, she was taught to be a martial arts master until she had this opponent named Yuki. Or they used to be friends and they used to battle all the time, but Yuki could never beat Nicole and retreated out to practice for the next time they meet. And it seems like that time has finally come, where Yuki, grown up now, meets Nicole at her job. Now, if you don't know, Yuki is uh, Masami's mom, and Masami's dad dad owns the rainbow factory where Nicole works. So that means Yuki has full ability to go around Nicole's job and mess with her at any point she wants because she's technically her boss, but Nicole resists her urges to fight as that life is behind her. She's a mom now, okay? She doesn't want to put her kids in harm's way. That's until Yuki goes too far and out of desperation of wanting to fight Nicole again, she threatens to get Nicole fired from the rainbow factory. And because she can't let that happen as that's her only job and that's how she supports her family, Nicole has no other choice but to go out and battle. This fight scene animated by Studio 4C is one of the most memorable moments in Gumball history. It's so goofy with a ton of anime and manga references. I love how just for this like two, three minute bit in an episode that this section has better animation than the whole season of some other anime. Not gonna name names, but 
you know which ones. And it highlights the, everything good about Nicole's character, about how she loves her family, about how violent and crazy she is sometimes, but how loving and, and cheerful she is. And not just her, but Richard as well, as there's one section earlier in the episode where Nicole is seriously upset about Yuki. And Richard is just cheering her and the family up, and it's so wholesome, and it shows off one really good aspect of his character. And at the end, they need to escape from the school that they destroyed after their battle. Number 38, the compilation. Closing in around the end of the season, we have a really fun episode based around a compilation that's a parody of shows like America's Funniest Home Videos. Where basically here, we see a bunch of unused and new jokes for using past secondary characters or based on past episodes of the show. And I really thought it wasn't going to mess with this one because like, you know, I thought it was going to be like other clip show episodes that no one likes. So this one proved to be different, not only with actual funny new bits, but even a really wholesome song at the end with its lyrics that make you really realize what the show's about. You're my half brother and my fully fledged friend. Be buddies forever from beginning to the end. Nobody's a nobody and everybody is weird like you and me. I'm the sugar, you're the lemon spirit, weird lemonade. But you're the brothers that I never trade. Nobody's a nobody and everybody is weird like you and me. And no matter what kind of person you are, there's always a place for you in the world. And now instead of trying to change to be normal, you should accept how different you are. And the message of the song also comes through in the supporting character singing along, reminding us how we can all relate to each one of each other and each one of these wacky characters in our own weird little way. And how the amazing world of Gumball isn't too different from our own. But this episode isn't all happy and laughs. In the compilation, they mention a lost episode of Gumball called The Grieving. You are about to see the first real footage from a lost episode called The Grieving. Most people who have watched it have never been seen again. The amazing world of Gumball cannot and will not accept any responsibility for the effects of what you're about to see. You have been warned. kind of funny if it was real though. Number 39, the stories. One day on a ride to school, the boys asked Molly to tell a story to pass the time, but it actually ends up doing the opposite because, well, Molly is boring. That's the main reason why she was cast into the rift in the void episode, why the universe thought she was a mistake. She's way too boring, but she still tries to tell stories all the time like they're interesting. And they don't want to break her heart by telling her how god awful she is at storytelling. So the boys stage a completely exciting, fun filled day for her to talk about and give stories about later. This whole fake scene and fake day set up by the boys really caught me off guard with some of the most random jokes out of nowhere. And even though Molly didn't actually end up telling a good story, this episode gave us this face, which I feel like makes up for all the sins, honestly. And finally, episode 40, the disaster. Finale season four, and it's gotta go out with a bang. So we catch up with Dr. Wrecker again, as his next plan to kill Gumball off forever is to use a magic remote that he got from the awesome store. And once he starts experimenting with this remote, he realizes how powerful it truly is. He wants to delete and ruin Gumball's world entirely, and oh, does he succeed. He uses the strange power of this remote to get Nicole and Richard divorced, to get Anais completely lost somewhere in the mall, to get Darwin so mad at Gumball that their friendship is over. He makes Gumball speed up an escalator to knock Penny off the side of a railing, shattering his relationship. And all of this because Gumball had left him behind and never included him or cared about him in his amazing world. This is easily Rob's most devious and most successful plan as Gumball's nemesis. So the two have an epic battle over this powerful magical remote until Rob realizes that he just can't win. <laughs> Oh, Rose. That's not even a man's name! Ow, 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 ow. 
and ends up throwing the remote into the void, which Gumball goes right in after. So in this void dimension, Gumball is actually able to catch up to the remote and avoid himself getting deleted by hitting the reverse button and sending him back to the start of all of this. And afterwards, we're hit with a to be continued sign. No, bro, I gotta say, I got some appreciation for the fourth wall breaking animations real quick. All of this is really marvelous and cool watching it. And because of it, I can see why people were really hyped for whatever came next. However, it did confuse me a little bit why Rob threw away his magic remote in the first place. Like, I, don't you still need to, that to control everybody? You know what? No, no questions right now. We'll see what comes out of it next in the next season. This is my final ranking for the season, and I'll see you all in season five. Guys, we need to stop for a second for a brief intermission. I just need to take this break to stop booing. Stop. Bo we, I just need to take this break to say that I have a Discord server. I have a Discord server. Got a lot of chats. Cool people. It'd be cool if you showed up. You feel me? That's all I wanted to say. That's all I wanted to say. Please, please stop throwing things and enjoy the next season. Season five. Let me just preface the season by saying this is the weirdest season by far. You see, it was at this point in the show where Gumball started to get more modern. As this season of the show was dropped in 2016. And later on, you'll see how they reference this period of time. A lot more memes, a lot more references that you might start to get. And a lot more episodes episodes that people like me that watched mainly in season three and season two have never seen before up until this point so we got 40 more episodes to cover but i want to ask a question are you enjoying this video i have a have a deep look within yourself i really hope you are episode one the rerun so at the return of the show we pick back up at the cliffhanger we were left on at the end of season four and as we saw before rob dumped gumball and the remote into the huge tv void dimension which gumball caught up to and got the remote and hit the rewind button bringing him back to the beginning of the day so we can fix everything so he goes through the same exact day trying to fix everything and ends up making everything goddamn worse turning his parents into babies drawing out darwin and i'm like 90 percent sure he just killed a nice like straight up but this time for the remote fight gumball actually ends up overpowering rob and pushing him into the void dimension but Gumball feels bad for killing someone that he treated wrong into the past, so he goes back in and he saves Rob from the Void Dimension, attempting to bring him back out. But, you know, Rob continues to fight him, even though he came all the way down to save him. Eventually, Rob does realize what Gumball's done for him, and he decides to hit rewind on all the mess and all the trouble he caused, so none of it ever happened. Now, originally, with my review, I was being hella negative, because the storyline of this one kind of confused me. Telling me Rob's entire goal in his life was to eliminate Gumball and be his rival. But the second he gets the ultimate chance, he rewinds it and then he just has to go about his day saying they won't be rivals anymore. Like what's his what's his character anymore? And even though they address that later on, I feel like the beauty of this episode doesn't really come from the story, but instead from the overabundance of amazing creativity showed off. The cool things that they do with this remote once they go to this other TV dimension is so meta and awesome, like Gumball recording a rock and then pressing play on the rock in a different location. One of the most interesting fight scenes I've ever seen. It's like they looked at a TV remote and just looked at every single button and just tasked the writers with coming up with a bit or a little gag for every single one. I am a little confused though, because why didn't they just hit the power button? Like they did it earlier on, wouldn't just and in that make the fight a lot easier but still i think the animation and the jokes in this one really carry for it to be a pretty good episode and there's an episode coming later that explains what happens to rob after this whole debacle and also all these tv bits and them going to this other dimension really shows that gumball is heading in a more meta direction with its comedy and its new episodes and while a lot of people aren't exactly fans of that sort of meta direction they took but i'm personally on the side that thinks that adding this sort of meta element to the storyline added a whole nother level to the show and made it more in-depth and more unique than it already was and it's sick you cannot tell me this doesn't look cool i will fight you right now episode two the guy nice name you know how it goes new season a nice needs a new friend as we all know a nice is in that fat socially awkward i want to make friends phase in her life right now so she goes around the school hunting for any kind of interaction until the boys and her spot this new guy we haven't seen before named josh who matches a nice's energy perfectly but the brothers and a nice don't trust that anyone normal would be her friend so easily so they do what brothers do and you know they set up multiple tests to see if he's really the right fit for a nice's friendship just say the word <sighs> Do I have to? Yeah, if you want us to find out what's wrong with him. Can't you just help me? Say it. Bro <sighs> Squad, activate! <laughs> Did 
This season is going to be prevalent and perfect for out of context clips, by the way. But after all this, Josh finds out that he was being tested by the bros and he feels kind of hurt that Anais wouldn't trust him right off the bat. But the boys convince her to go back to him and maybe they can connect a little bit more. But Josh does actually end up being a weirdo in the end. Excuse me, what are you doing? Measuring her up for her pod. They do take some time to build. Pod? Yeah, now she's my friend. She'll be cryogenically frozen with me until the year 4983, when our great and powerful leader, Crawtalk, will be finally hatched from his meat egg and rule us all. That's why we give him all our money, to help finish the construction of his graphene palace on System 26. This is Crawtalk. And even though I wasn't really feeling this one, it shows how endearing the boys are when it comes to their little sister, despite how dysfunctional they can seem together. And Josh's character doesn't really have much I could talk about. He's, he's kind of predictable. He's just like, oh, this, this guy must be weird. He's friends with our sister. Oh, wait, he is a weirdo that supports a frog god. Yeah, there's nothing much to say there. This one's decent. He didn't see it. Draws attention to it. Make a wallet sound. Wallet. That's not the sound of wallet. Hey, you do it then if you're so... Actually, that was really good. Number three, the boredom. For the first time in a long time, Gummel and Darwin have nothing to do. At least they think they don't in their tiny little tunnel vision worldview. But in reality, there's a whole load of crazy and cool shit going on around them. You know, people drown, police chases, people die, Banana Joe gets a lightsaber, Principal Brown gets naked, Miss Simeon gets naked. But unfortunately, the boys don't get to see any of it by bad timing after bad timing after bad timing. I enjoyed this one for a different reason as it stands out because the pacing of the jokes, it's not like it got faster here. It felt more slow. It would spend time setting itself up and then showing the punchline instead of rapid fire joke after rapid fire joke after rapid fire joke and you know i appreciate it because i didn't really expect that out of gumball and it's kind of caught me by surprise and speaking of unexpected i never expected gumball to just do a whole cameo like this like while they're just bored on the couch outside their window there's like a five second cameo for other cartoon network shows like clarence regular show uncle grandpa and i think this goes to show a jump in a more recent and current direction that the show was taking it was just really surprising episode four the Vision. Alan, the good balloon, the golden boy, the nicest air-filled guy in Elmore, right? He must be holding a dark secret behind everyone's back, obviously. No, 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 we already did this. We already, like, Gumball tried to prove that Alan was actually bad so many times that it's gotten old at this point. He hasn't done anything. My Vision by Alan Keane, a manifesto on how I will gain the power I need to purge Elmore Jr. High of its greatest problem? What? So Alan wants to be the school president and to make sure everyone in the school goes in the best possible direction for the future. So he wants to put in place some changes to make everyone a little bit happier with the idea of happiness concentration camps. The idea of Alan secretly being evil and having evil motives has been teased before in the past, but the joke hasn't actually been a reality. They never actually pushed that button on it. Finally, they made an episode based on it. And Gummel and Darwin have to try and stop Alan while he's still a young kid before he becomes a huge dictator. And this episode is everything I imagined from finally having an episode based around this topic. It reminds me of episode like The Safety, but unlike Darwin, Alan doesn't actually have the chance to implement his plans and go through with it. But you know, still a good episode. Activate sniper mode. Dude, what are you doing? Episode 5, The Choices. Ladies and gentlemen, the highest rated episode of Gumball of all time on IMDb. And even though I don't fully agree that this should be the highest rated, I still think it's pretty amazing. As there's pretty much nothing wrong with this one and gets us to connect with Nicole and Richard even more as we finally see how the two met. So after a pretty serious fight in the family where we think Nicole's gonna get pushed to her ends and have another episode of The Limit until we get a look into Nicole's mind into understanding why her life ended up like this and she brings it all back of course to where she first initially met Richard and we see exactly how that happened as we see the entire city of Elmore younger than we've ever seen them Nicole we need to talk about your report card but I got straight A's not here gender uh, yeah F because I'm female being a girl is not an excuse it's so cool to see these characters we know now as kids and Nicole experiments in her head what life would be like if she went down different avenues and maybe got married to different people in Elmore other than Richard. She's experimenting with the story tree like she's playing the Telltale game. Nicole, are you okay? Banana nana, banana nana. Oh, banana not. Banana. Oh, better not. And after seeing nightmarish other outcomes, my favorite was her getting with Nelson, Tobias's dad, and then turning into a plastic wife. 
So, how do you like the sushi? It took me hours. It's cold. Let me heat it up for you. Is that hot enough for you? Is it, is it hot enough? Is it hot enough for you? Almost worth it. Damn, Gumball can get dark sometimes, bro. But the best part of this entire episode is the wholesome connection we see Richard and Nicole make. And it's so adorable to see them meet this cute chubby rabbit just stuck in his log and then she breaks him out. And then Nicole, since Nicole was actually running away from her parents to like make it to a karate competition that they put her in, she was already really stressed out. But once she met Richard, all of her stresses and worries started to fade away. And that's when she realized that there's more to life than just doing what your parents want you to do. And we see their life branch off into eventually dating each other, living together, wanting to start a family until a magical moment happens when Our main man of the show is born. I think Moist Critical said it best. Yeah, baby! That's what I've been waiting for! That's what it's all about! Woo! And this is the most personal we've seen Gumball get in a long time. It goes to show a lot of things about why this show is great and why it's top tier. From the animation to the incredible creativity with the various plot lines and the music. Oh my. I feel like I'd be disrespectful to call this anything other than extraordinary. And this episode is just lunar, man. I feel like you could show this to anyone who just writes Gumball off as like a goofy show for kids. Someone who, all, who like only watched season one and immediately switched them to like, oh yeah. This isn't just like kid kitty bullshit. This is art. Number six, the code. Oh boy, I love when the cartoons reference my internet. Here we see the Watersons Wi-Fi go down. And which since they're youngsters that are addicted to their damn Wi-Fi connections, they go around trying to make the internet in real life. Doing toxic voice chats face to face, Yelp reviews on real food, sending physical DMs, <laughs> all that jazz. Also, Richard here gets exposed as a cosplayer. Um I don't really know how to feel about this. And because they're tired of all this, they just decide whatever, and they try to hack Mr. Robinson for his Wi-Fi password. All right, so me being someone that's terminally online, I got kind of tired of the early 2010 internet humor. It's kind of the same issue that a lot of cartoons have, where they make a joke about the internet that's been done a million times. And it's especially bad when the joke is about an, an era of the internet that we've passed together as a society. But I did appreciate the hacking section, as I think the animation here looks really unique and dope. But also, I'm noticing these moments a lot more in recent gumball where the boys get pulled out of their imaginations and delusions to realize what they're doing in real life and i could be looking too deep into it but i see these little bits where you know they immediately snap back to reality as something coming along with the boys aging as they're starting to realize more about reality and have less and less of these really deep imagination sections episode seven the scam halloween night falls upon elmore and there's an evil creeping amongst the school halls a demonic entity only known as gagara the devourer who would come and haunt and devour anything that laid in this path including children hey! an a really no i meant until nah it's just carrying gumball pranking everybody and scamming them out of their halloween candy i love the idea of an episode based around scamming kids out of their halloween candy bro it's such a simple like 90s movie premise it can go so many directions and also uh we got a new ship boys what is wrong with you i'm tired darwin i'm tired of having to wear a mask on halloween because people wouldn't give me candy nothing can make me go along with this dishonest scam not even to get close to carrie if she's gonna eat all that candy she'll need a body to possess Yo, 
Yo, that kiss in season two wasn't for nothing after all. We're introduced for the first time to Darwin and Carrie's crushes, which I find cute as hell. And I find that the two main characters dating the two best written girls in the show is a W decision from the writers. But it turns out that Gumball and Darwin can't fake being ghost hunters forever. As they did end up being right about getting candy, they were also right about Gargaroth. See, the story of Gargaroth was one that Gumball thought Carrie made up, but apparently it's actually real and not really fiction. So now everyone in town believes them to be real ghost hunters and they need to go in and destroy this literal actual demon and they figured the best way to defeat him is to implode him with candy as i already said i love carrie and darwin being in a relationship now that will soon develop in other episodes along with how gross looking they made gargaroth this is up there for one of the better halloween episodes number eight the test do you guys remember buzzfeed quizzes weren't they so wacky and zany those quizzes where you answer four random things and they give you a random answer and you just kind of have to go with it you do it with your friends sometimes well some internet buzzfeed type quiz turns off the whole dynamic of the show. This man Gumball twerked on the keyboard and it called him a loser. What this random internet test points out to Gumball after doing it over and over again is that he really is a loser. That's his character type. His whole character premise is that he's a jerk who we all love to laugh at when we see him fail. And Gumball hates this so he tries to improve and change himself to be nicer and more popular. This sounds alright. However, for the entire show of Gumball to go on, they need a loser dynamic to be the main character. So we have someone else take the mantle. Hey dudes! Notice anything different? Yeah, you look like a- You look like a cannelloni filled with idiots! You look like the sausage on top of your head hasn't finished loading! You look like a snore! You look like a new man! Ah, look at the top of his head! <laughs> and all of a sudden, this turns into the Tobias show. Tobias turns the whole show into a parody of a terrible 90s sitcom, and Sarah and Darwin can only watch and need to go and try and get Gumball back. Since this is, this is awful. This can't keep going. This is like if Jesse and Dog with a Blog had a baby. Actually, what am I saying? Both of those shows went hard. This episode jokes and references got so meta and wild, even for Gumball standards, like Sarah being Sarah and criticizing how bad the Tobias episode was while it was still going on. This is just the writers taking shots at themselves, holy. And I know I've shown a lot of hate to him, but Tobias was really good here. Even though the show was supposed to purposefully be bad, it, he did make me laugh with a few of his bits in here. They were just ironically funny. And even at the point where he was getting annoying, uh, we got to see Gumball literally melt his face off. Guess friendship is the one boat that will never sink. <laughs> Do it. So, uh, yeah. GG's. Number nine, the slide. You know, dating app, you ever wonder what Tinder would be like in the Gumball universe? Rocky's having trouble in his love life after he's unable to score what he thinks is his soulmate. So he goes to a few middle schoolers to help him find a new woman and set up the dating app until he sees his soulmate that he missed out on named Birdie on the app. And he's obsessed with trying to meet her to the point where he'll even catfish her. All right. I like this episode more than other episodes about like, you know, current trends and current internet and current apps because this episode didn't really feel dated. The jokes about dating apps still work and they still feel pretty fresh and funny to this day. It's asking me to write a bio. How would you describe my financial situation? Tragic? It also wants to know my hobbies. Well? I like cheese and internet memes. That's gonna be a hard sell. I get profiles of girls located in the same town and I slide down when I see the one I like. If she does the same, we get to chat. Oh, he looks like a puppet made out of me! Her hair looks like it's made out of lots of little hairs! And what's wrong with her hands? Oh, dude, she's got five fingers! Slide up, slide up! Now, now we're, we're talking. talking! While episodes like The Code feel old school, this still feels like it could be made today and makes sense. And they put their own gumball spin on this already funny topic, just making it as absurd as possible. Like how swiping up on someone in the app literally swipes them into the heavens. Poor Rocky, man. He was great in this episode, but he's just, he's too down bad. This man was ready to date a rock. Episode 10, The Loophole. Bobber is a robot, so any command given to him, it will take it as literally as possible. To the point where it's pretty dangerous to even tell him to do anything as he might just turn into a killing machine. So the boys put in place some rules for Bobber to be more safe, but he ends up getting around them. And for every rule they give him, he finds a loophole. In what manner would you like Darwin to be saved? It doesn't matter, just pick one! <laughs> Why on earth would you choose such an undignified method? 
He has the super scary AI moment where he realizes that the only true killing machines and the worst thing that happened to Earth is mankind, so he wants to exterminate everything on the planet. It's that classic AI takes over the world story that's getting disturbingly more and more realistic, but it ends with Gumball and Darwin finding a loophole around Bobbert's rules to make him stop. And I thought this episode was pretty cool. It was like a mini, like, disaster movie. Bobbert literally turns into HAL 9000, a super intelligent AI from the movie A 3001 Space Odyssey. Not a single kid who watched this knows what they're referencing. I still love that Gumball will just do stuff like this, just because. Episode 11, The Copycats. Oh, uh, we got a classic on our hands, boys. Where the Watersons meet their doppelgangers. Ugh, look at this one, Darwin. Minced fat and connective tissue in a cellulose casing sprayed with liquid flavoring and salt water. It's not as weird as powdered goat milk. Who needs that? A lactose intolerant astronaut. <laughs> Chi-Chi, look, there's a new exotic food section. Ew, look at this one, Ribbit. Mint's fat and connected tissue in a cellulose casing? Uh -huh. All right, so this episode comes with a real-life story. So let me explain. Back in 2014, there was a show that was released in China called Miracle Star. A show so good, it only made it to 12 episodes. This children's animated series was a story about a goat named Chi-Chi and a frog named Ribbit and their misadventures in their magical world. And um, it wasn't long before the internet noticed a few similarities between Miracle Star and a and a certain British show. I can't I can't quite my, put, put my finger on the name. Miracle Star was literally a direct ripoff of Gumball down to a few of the scenes being like frame for frame the exact same show. And this show is actually getting some money and a little bit of traction in China, but I don't think anyone expected them to respond like this. In this episode of Gumball, the Watterson family meets their Chinese copycats, literally beats their ass, then sings to them an entire song on how they should be themselves and stop copying their life, and then literally kills them off in a giant explosion. Uh, you guys good? I- I don't have to say anything else. This episode's S tier. But not to mention, every bit in this episode is also hilarious. I loved every second of watching these guys get destroyed. The main bit here where the Watersons would do something and then it would immediately be copied by these people. And then Anais being the reason why the Watersons survived in the end, but the copycat family doesn't have Anais because of China's laws against daughters. And instead of outright suing them, Gumball saw this as content and they made jokes about the weird translations and weird laws coming from China. What? What you are doing is straight up criminal. So just try and be original. Be your own you. Be your own you. Don't do what I do. Just be your own you. And when you stop being such a dirty hack, get in your stupid car and don't come back. Get in your stupid car and don't come back. Dick damn it! We'll never get rid of them! This is literally two kids shows having beef like commentary channels. It's so good. One of the most memorable episodes of all time. It's gotta be top tier. Episode 12, the potato. So at the end of the copycats, they ended the episode with this bit. I guess they're too messed up to be on TV now. That'll teach them for trying to replace us. Yeah, as if anyone else could do what I do. Yeah, we're irreplaceable. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the gumball way of transitioning in voice actors like they did in the kids. When in that episode, they switched from Logan Grove and Quezzy Bokie to Jacob Hopkins and Terrell Ransom Jr. And now they slot in for the latest Danielle T. Hensley Jr. and Nicholas Cantu. Or as many people know, Nicholas Cantu, Junkie Jenker on YouTube. That has nothing to do with this episode. But anyway, in the potato, Darwin realizes something that we can all relate to, and that's his love of consuming literally anything potato related. Like he dines on any potato dish every day and night, right in front of his living potato friend Idaho. And Gumball kind of helps him realize uh, this cruelty and tries to help him put an end to it until it gets to the point where Darwin goes insane without potatoes and needs to separate himself from the world and get away from Idaho altogether. That is until Idaho starts heading over to Darwin to spend some quality time with him and Gumball and Sarah need to save him. Until it turns out the twist being is that Idaho doesn't really care what Darwin eats. It's just some random potatoes. Not like all potatoes know each other. He can eat whatever he wants. I like how Idaho is just so chill with watching his brothers get consumed here. It's like, I, don't, I don't know. There's not really much to talk about here. I thought that was funny. Some of the bits in this episode did feel sort of awkward. I'm proud of you, buddy. Openly admitting you've got a problem is the first step to recovery. Okay. I have a problem! Great! All better. Dude, that's not the only step to recovery. I might be saying that just because this is the first time that I heard the new voices in Gumball, but something about a lot of the jokes here didn't really feel timed correctly. And I mean, this episode is pretty okay. You know, nothing crazy really happens. Um, well, besides this. Huh. I don't feel any different. 
Do I look okay? Potato. Potato. Potato, potato. Potato, potato. But hello, darling, nice to see you. Glad to have you back with us. Potato, 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 potato. Number 13, the fuss. Sad Nicole is sad today because no one in the family remember that today is a special day. Dirty socks and filthy clothes When all I wanted was a sweet red rose He made me laugh with things he said But now he can't remember the day we Nicole remembers that today is November 1st, aka her and Richard's anniversary. And he forgot that. Oh, shoot. And no one said anything. Well, while the kids try to make Nicole feel better with a very neutral party, Richard tries to really think hard and hard. And I'm talking disgustingly hard. Like, I don't know why they animated this. What's going on? I think he's using his brain. This is dangerous. He's pushing way past his usual limits. Until he finally realizes that he's not going to be able to remember this date, and he just decides to go and get it tatted on him so he'll never forget it again. Unfortunately, though, Richard actually wasn't the one in the wrong. It was for once Nicole, as she ended up reading the date wrong. And the date wasn't actually their anniversary, but instead the calendar was upside down. And when Nicole goes to apologize, it turns out Richard already left to go and get the tattoo. So the family's got to try to stop him before he does. And during this running scene, there's a split screen where they do a meta joke where they can't see in front of them. And oh my god, Anai, is she okay, bro? They've gotten so good at drawing painful faces. I can feel that. But it does turn out that even though she was wrong, the ending ends up being pretty wholesome with uh, Richard getting his tattoo fixed to say love. She messed up with the date and she was wrong. <gasps> <laughs> well, that's a day to remember. <sighs> Aww, just kidding. I know exactly how to fix this. Now I'll never forget to think about you every day. What do you think? <laughs> I love it. And I love when the story can balance both wholesome water sins and dysfunctional crazy water sins. It's all in the subtext, like when someone says, I'm only two minutes away. We should stay in touch. Or, it's fine, honey. Uh, okay. So are you gonna tell us what we should be celebrating? Don't worry about it, sweetheart. Number 14, The Outside. We get to see Richard's dad, Frankie, again, as he lives in a trash shack in the middle of a terrible neighborhood. So this time, to get out of his old shed, he sets up a plan to sneak into the Watterson's house and maybe mooch off them for a while, as, you know, Frankie's a little sly dog, a little, little greasy sleazeball. But the Watterson's had this idea in their head that while Frankie left Richard during their childhood, they all assumed that he was in prison. So to make him feel more at home, they turned their whole house into a correctional facility. I feel like everyone fits their role in the prison so well. With Nicole being the angry officer, Anais being the cynical leader, and Gummo and Darwin being the troublemaking, insane asylum patients. Frankie's character being this lazy, schmoozy sort of stand-up comedian is a pretty fitting personality for the type of guy he is and what he and how he treats his family. And him being a sort of stand-up comedian, always trying to make light and a joke out of something. We see the connection and how he's similar to Richard, even though he didn't even raise him. Number 15, the vase. Brandy JoJo's back. Yeah. But this time it's to pick up her vase that she dropped off for Nicole to watch because she actually needs that vase as it actually holds on to somebody's ashes. What Granny Jojo doesn't know is that Nicole's been trying to destroy this dumbass vase for like weeks. And recently she's handed it over to Darwin, Anais, and Gumball to go and destroy, which they find a wrecking site and throw the vase in the car to get destroyed. And then we just get minutes of Nicole being a badass doing parkour across these broken cars in this junkyard to only get the vase back and realize that it was the wrong one. I could only be saying that this episode is good because I was preemptively told that it was bad and it was in fact not bad I forgot who told it to me but they were like my least favorite episode recently is the vase oh my god dude it's trash but this one was just like I didn't really mind it I mean it was cool to see Nicole do some epic parkour stuff Randy Jojo wasn't that annoying I mean she only had a few lines and Gummo, Darwin and Anais were funny in ways that they were trying to destroy the vase but just nothing was working it was like a Nokia we're 16 the matchmaker we get a continuation of the Darwin and Carrie relationship by seeing them go through a misunderstanding that actually ends up bringing them closer Darwin at this point hasn't actually confessed his feelings to Carrie yet. Even though it seems sort of obvious, they haven't actually made it official. So, because of this, Darwin is upset and he sings this beautiful love song where he drowns in a room full of his tears.
This is coming straight out of a 2005 emo band, but it sounds beautiful. Walking in on this, Gumball completely misunderstands the situation. He wants to help his buddy get with his crush, of course, but looking at the photo on his computer, Gumball accidentally thinks that Darwin is in love with Terry, the paper girl. So he ends up telling Carrie that Darwin doesn't love her and to make a love potion so he can get Darwin and Terry together. So this love potion ends up being made in a very strangely seductive way. Oh. It's just what happens when you stir a love potion. And then Gummo plays Cupid and uses the potion on both of them to where- Yes! I love you too, Darwin! <laughs> <laughs> Darwin, I love you too. Darwin, I love you too. Well, but things go wrong fast as Gumball eventually realizes that Darwin was in love with Carrie and not Terry. So he has to find a way to reverse the potion. This one was pretty cute, especially how at the end, true love for Carrie broke the love potion's curse. But it got so goddamn weird at some points. Like that love potion caused some devious activity. Come on now, baby. I don't think there's a cure for that. Number 17, the box. A box shows up at the Watersons' front door that wasn't for them originally. They don't really want to open it because, you know, this wasn't for them. This was from this was for one of their neighbors. So instead of opening it, each of the family members spends their time imagining what could possibly be in this box. Which this episode is more of a clip show for them to make culture references. As Gumball imagines a portal gun from Portal, Anais imagines a zombie virus similar to the movie Wreck, Nicole imagining being chased down by bounty hunters for their money, and Darwin imagines nothing in it. This episode was very random, but it's kind of cool seeing the movies and game references mix in with the Gumball verse. And also Richard imagines this sort of Mission Impossible parody where he makes out with former President George W. Bush right after doing some epic moves. So, I, you know, I can't really complain about this one. Number 18, the console. Holy talk about classics. Gumball gets a new game console from Richard that he bought from the Awesome Store. Now, this console seems just like a weird knockoff of the Game Boy, a Soldier Boy, if you will. But once he powers it on, there is one game on the console already. And this game he finds himself on is so immersive that it transforms his whole world into a JRPG. Filled with anime and gaming references. And while some people don't like the cultural reference episodes... I'll admit, I'm, I'm a little biased. The sheer amount of good references and incredible pixel animation, I would not be mad if they had these pixel graphics for the rest of the show. Just every meta bit of this actually looking like a RPG game is so good, and it really opened my eyes to how truly no other show does it like Gumball. Leslie? What happened to you? I bought some fertilizer from the awesome store! I went home after visiting the awesome store! And used the fertilizer I just bought at the awesome store! Okay, okay, we got it, we got it. The awesome store is the villain. The awesome store! Make it stop! I can't! There's no command to skip through his cutscene! Awesome Kill something! Hold on! The awesome we could have just walked away, but now maybe we should run. I know I'm kind of being a hog writer right now, but I, I really just don't see a lot of other shows doing these sort of deep reference episodes with this amount of effort put into references about like Earthbound, Mario RPGs, and other RPG games. And I highly recommend this episode in particular for its storytelling. It's like a movie. Number 19, the Ollie. Gumball wants to be cool and popular, so he takes up skateboarding and becomes a full-on skater boy. I just want to be a skater boy. And she says, see you later, boy. But when Darwin also tries to hop on the board and skate, it goes massively wrong and he starts cascading down a hill. So Gumball has to go and save him in this sort of street art animation style. Now, I don't get many of the skating references, but this episode still slaps. All the jokes are great and the pacing is perfect. There's also some of the smoothest and coolest animations I've seen in the show. I also find it funny that when they interviewed the people that animated the section, the reason why Gumball skated in front of this hot dog car instead of just a normal car was because of censorship issues with Cartoon Network. As they thought if Gumball was shown skating in front of an actual car, kids would try to attempt this in real life and end up getting hurt. Oh yeah, because skating in front of a car would be the most dangerous thing they showed in the show. Okay. Episode 20, The Catfish. Are you searching your name online again? No, I've learned my lesson. Every time I close my eyes, I can still see those weird drawings of me. Who draws that stuff? So you know how Louis is legally the grandparents of Gumball and Darwin now? Well, Louis actually ends up getting catfished by Gumball and Darwin as he's trying to make a friend on an online site. Although the way he's texting could suggest that he's not just trying to make friends. Jojo, she opened my eyes to something greater. Love. Everything about her was magical. Her luscious lips. Her flowing hair. Her cutie patootie. I'm sorry, but I refuse to picture that last image. Goodbye, cruel world. 
until Granny Jojo finds out that Louie's trying to meet a woman in real life and assumes he's trying to cheat on her. Poor Louie, man. All he wanted was some friends and all he got was beat up by his wife and depression. And Granny Jojo going after the lady that was in the profile picture that Gummo and Darwin didn't realize was a real person. This was like one of the first times I ever found Granny Jojo pretty funny. Just a slapstick she does and the amount of jealous that she gets over literally anything that interacts with her man. Episode 21, The Cycle. So Tobias's family, we've had an episode of, on Tobias, his mom, but there's one more member that we haven't really focused on. Where now we see that the dad, Harold, over and over since high school has been making fun and picking on Richard. And now since they live in the same neighborhood, uh, Richard's been getting bullied even harder and harder. And the kids realize that their dad has no goddamn backbone whatsoever, so they have to stand up for him and help him overcome Harold. But the kids help Richard realize Harold's true weakness, that being money. And when they bait him with a fake one billion dollar check, uh, he kind of goes crazy and starts spending things immediately before even going to cash it in. You know, it doesn't make any sense why he'd start doing this. He's not really a good villain, kind of like his son, but I think that was on purpose because goddamn did it feel good to watch Richard get revenge. Harold, you and I have never been friends, but there's something you need to know. Oh, wait, first you have to see that. I'm sorry we couldn't fit all of you in there. There wasn't enough space on the canvas. <laughs> hey, Harold, I need to talk to you in private. See ya. Sorry, Richard. I, I apologize for thinking you were a buffoon all these years. See, kids? That's how adults deal with their problems. I'm impressed, Dad. But what did you say to him? I told him if he stacks his dynamite closer together, he'll get a more intensive blast. Number 22, the stars. When Richard goes into Larry's barbershop to ask for a haircut, he politely asks Larry to give him the normal fade. But Larry actually has to remind him that you appear to be bald. Bald. I've never seen someone more devastated to fight out their bald. Bro is actually flabbergasted. Richard, having his pride destroyed and feeling humiliated, uh, goes back home upset. But his brain cannot accept that at all, and instead of acknowledging his problems, the kids influence him to go and blame Larry and give him a bad review on his service, giving his barbershop a one-star review. Which afterwards, Larry convinces Richard to take down the one-star review in exchange of free service. It's Larry! <gasps> it's Larry! <gasps> it's Larry! Uh, yes, it's Larry. I'm calling about your review. How are you so sure it was me? I used a fake name. What you said was uncalled for, mean, and frankly full of grammatical errors. But it's my philosophy that the customer is always right. So if you take down the review, you can get free haircuts for you and your family. And? <sighs> and you have a thick How thick? Quite thick. I'll take it! After this, the boys realize that they have the power to abuse not only Larry, but anybody with a one-star review for free stuff, since people care way too much about their presence online or whatever. After doing this to a couple restaurants, the boys then make Larry create a website where you can rate people based on stars, and you can rate people based on anything, based on how good they are, looks, intelligence, actions. God, this would be terrible if it existed in real life. Actually, it kind of does already exist in real life. It's called Twitter. And this ends up going terribly, since nobody wants to do anything that will give them a lower score, leading everyone to just be frozen in place. This theme for an episode is very Black Mirror-esque, and I thought it was really funny how it eventually led to the whole world stopping because they're scared of seeing their score get worse. And at the end, the boys had to go to Larry to get them to end this app so people can get to moving again and the world can go back to normal. But to do that, Richard needs to accept his bald ass head. I did like this part a lot because Larry actually had some backbone and was a good character. You know, he started off as a complete pushover, but eventually eventually gained some power and used it against the boys. Even though he almost made the issue worse, uh, Richard being annoying and non accepting of his baldness is what saved the day at the end, which is why it was all the more satisfying to see them all get hit. Yay! I can go back to not caring what anyone wow. thinks. This is all your fault! The sunlight bounced off the top of your head! How else could that happen if you weren't bald? <laughs> All right, I'll admit it. I'm bald. Also, question, how the hell is Tobias's dad frozen in the mall and on a bike next to the characters at the same time? Man, what that don't make no sense. Number 23, the grades. <sighs> What's wrong with your face? I'm smiling, isn't it obvious? No, it looks like you're trying to eat your own chin. Why are you trying to smile anyway? I found it. Uh, let's not jump to conclusions. It could be any Principal Brown on that FBI warrant. It's a common name. Hmm? Oh, um, listen, I'm not a furry. I just wanted to know what I'd look like with a tail. What? What else have you been hiding? 
She knows. Finish her now before she tells all the others. Uh, no, that's it. Uh, so what is it that you found? Miss Simeon goes through Gumball's school files and figures out that back in kindergarten, he failed a quote-unquote test by answering one question wrong, making his GPA 0.1.2 low to attend the Elmore Junior High. So he gets sent all the way back to kindergarten to redo it, I guess. <laughs> Gumball starts off feeling tortured and going crazy amongst all these kids around him. But at one point, he realizes that nothing's going to change the situation and he might as well just go with it. I mean, now instead of homework, all he has to do is chill all day. So he lets go of all of his inhibitions and just relaxes with these kindergartens. Till Miss Simeon realizes that she may have made a mistake getting Gumball out of the school as she needs him. Because if she doesn't have him in her class, then she'll be under the minimum amount of people that she needs to keep being a teacher. Do you want to get back to your old class? No way! I love it here. Everyone looks up to me. I mean, mainly because of the height difference, but it's still a good feeling. Okay, I got a level with you. If you don't come back, I'm fired. <gasps> As if I needed more reasons to stay here. <gasps> what are you doing? It's weird. I'm crying. It looks like you're trying to lay an egg with your face. Please stop. <laughs> stop it. <sighs> okay, fine. I'll come back. <sighs> Thank you. And now Gumball needs to pass the test to get back into the school. Now, Gumball is a show that is, and I say this in the most respectful way possible, dumb. And while a lot of the time this dumbness is used in a way that it's funny, sometimes it's just kind of annoying and I wish a little bit more thinking was put into some of the storylines. Like how Gumball failed a test in kindergarten, so he goes back to kindergarten and he starts enjoying the place, but he ends up going back to the middle school even after letting go of his inhibitions and enjoying the place, all because Miss Simeon started making some goofy faces. And that was all it took that got him to come back, which he then goes on to flawlessly pass the test easily despite not studying or trying and completely failing at all the cheating attempts that Miss Simeon laid out for him. I don't know, it was aggravating a little bit and Miss Simeon just was so weird here. The best part about this episode would have to be Principal Brown because I loved what they've done with this character over the years. It's gotten to a point where Principal Brown has got to be a war criminal. Like, that's like the only thing that would explain some of the stuff that goes on around this man. Number 24, the diet. Richard finally starts acknowledging his weight problems and goes on a diet, although he doesn't really know what a diet is. And he thinks that just eating food on smaller plates makes it a diet. Nah, he's, he's, he's just too obsessed with food. He turns into a monster and somehow turns into an even fatter Richard. But he looks kind of adorable. I'm gonna be honest. And I quickly realized that Richard can't just abandon food. He's so obsessed with it to the point that he will scheme to get any sort of sustenance he can. So the boys figure out how to start tricking his brain into enjoying exercise and swapping out the food that they're tricking him with with continuously healthier and healthier food. And they have a training montage, baby, which gets Richard looking pretty healthy. I mean, he went down a size in his shirt and those double chins are gone. And the boys call it a good day's work. Although, they start to realize that Richard's enjoying that montage a little too much. I'm sure he'll tire himself out soon. Hey, get off of my car! Get out of the way, Watterson! Get out of the way of my car! That's right, buddy! Honk if you think I'm Tonk! Oh, look, we've created a monster. After he goes full Chad, Richard turns into a massive douchebag that wants to show his muscles to the world, which he then goes rampant on the town just to flex his beautiful oily chest. We get so many shots of him just being a goddamn hunk. Come on, Darwin, remind him of his love of food again, and then he immediately goes back to having a normal life. Providing viewers with a genuine way to actually get into exercise, and goddamn, this single image makes this episode solidly good. Number 25, The X. Alright, so the first episode of Season 5, The Rerun, the one where Rob rewinded time and reset him and Gumball's rivalry. It didn't really make that much sense to me why he would continue the rivalry even though they quote unquote like each other now. Well, this episode kind of addressed that problem I had with that one, turned it around and made a hilarious plot out of it. So Gumball is obsessed with having a nemesis. Notice how he talks about him like an obsessed girlfriend. <gasps> no! It's my mortal enemy, Rob! Do you think he saw me? Have I ever told you about Rob? Yeah, once or twice. And then Rob tried to blow up the dam, and then he said, I am your nemesis. That's me at the time the bus went through the tunnel as Rob tried to blow them all and explained to Penny about how, like, Rob's my nemesis. Yeah, Gumball, that's right now. He's gone into the hardware store! He's probably getting stuff for me. You know, stuff to destroy me with. He seems to be buying a circular saw. Is the blade diamond-edged? No, just a regular blade. That's okay. 
we're not there yet. That's until Gumball finds out later that after the incident where the two made up, Rob doesn't really have any reason to be Gumball's nemesis anymore. And they go through a sort of sloppy nemesis breakup. And Rob decides that he wants to be Banana Joe's nemesis now. So Gumball feels kind of jealous and destroyed by this, but he needs a pep talk to get back in the ring. Penny assures to him that he can get his nemesis back if he tries hard enough. And basically Gumball has this plan to try and annoy Rob into being his nemesis again, which actually ends up working out. As the world burns around him, star-crossed nemesis are connected once again. I really appreciate this. They took what was initially a big plot hole for me and rewrote it to be funny and actually make their rivalry make sense again. I love it. Gold stars everyone involved. The only thing I don't like is how this episode kind of symbolizes the show's new relationship with Gumball and Penny. As the way Gumball's acting here really reminds me of Darwin in the bros, down to like the same scene of them dressing up as the person their bro is obsessed with. Back then in season three, the show was really focused on Gumball and Penny's relationship, but now I see this as a shift as the show being more focused on Gumball and Rob's relationship. And at this point in the series, you'll start to see Penny used less and less in episodes. And it's kind of upsetting to see my favorite character kind of get thrown into the backseat because, well, Gumball got the girl. What else is there to do with her? Luckily, she does have some good moments and good episodes still coming up, but I still feel like they could have done more with her character after she broke out the show. She's already shown she has a personality to carry a whole episode by herself. So, I mean, number 26, the sorcerer. Gumball and Darwin with some kind of exciting power. So they approach Hector's witch mom to learn some of her magical abilities until they're told promptly no. But they really, really need to convince his mom that they're ready for this. So we see the two then doing magical chores to, to hone in their skills so they can finally become the ultimate wizards that they always wanted. That is until an actual magical disaster is about to occur. Once the two see this door that they're told not to open, they pull a gum on Darwin and open it, to which Darwin gets eaten by a troll. The troll then escapes into the town and starts killing Hundred. Global warming isn't real. <gasps> I'm sorry, but there are scientific proofs I that think you mean there is scientific proof. Don't they teach grammar at Yoga Academy? For your information, yoga is a very physical and noble activity. No need to get so excited, Han. I am a man! Hard to tell with that voice and that ponytail. You don't have to get all defenses. I'm not being defensive! I love for how magical and grand that the world of Gumball is. They take magic itself and turn it into like a... How do I say this? They normalize it. Like how the witch lady gave Gumball a demo version of her magic or how she just has magical items laying around her house or how she just uses magic all the time but they can do some crazy stuff involving animation and seems involving magic including this troll fight where this troll is the embodiment of an internet reddit troll and the only way to defeat him is to troll the troll back and giving this troll the personality of an actual internet troll actually kind of gave it a likable character instead of just being this big strong scary monster and it wasn't like the cliche monster where they had to take it down by playing it to sleep or actually defeating it it was actually different where gumball could just defeat it in a roast battle Kind of stupid sounding, but I really enjoyed it. Episode 27, The Menu. The boys are discussing at the mall about how they think that Joyful Burger has a secret menu item. And Richard is intrigued, as anyone would be. Who does not want to taste a greasy, greasy secret menu item? So they then go on a mission to get a secret menu item off of Larry. Great job! The board wants you two as managers. Job. The board wants you as our new CEO. And in other news, business moguls Gumball and Darwin Watterson have sold their joyful burger shares for a whopping $4.6 billion. Our reporter has an exclusive interview from their lavish new mansion. So, how do you feel about your success? It's cool. I mean, I like the big house, but it's kind of hard to communicate with each other. Oh, one moment. Sorry, you were saying? What gave you the idea of getting into the fast food industry in the first place? Well, it all started when my father wanted to try a secret burger and we got completely sidetracked. So it turns out the way to get the secret menu burger is to eat at every single Joyful Burger location in Elmore in under an hour. So the family starts zooming around locations and at the same time, we get to watch Richard gorge himself on fast food. And uh, bro, uh, I genuinely don't get the gross out spots. I wanna see the section of the storyboard that someone wrote out that was like, and then we zoom in on Richard squeezing lard and cheese out of his pores. And at the end, when Richard is literally crawling on his hands and knees to get to this final burger, his heart literally stops, but he has to push through it, and he finally gets there. 
only to not even be able to eat the burger as his whole body is already filled with them. Gumball and Darwin won't even eat it either. They're just, they're not into that. So we're just kind of left off with Fat Richard and a delicious burger uneaten. It just feels kind of anticlimactic. Number 28, The Uncle. Oh boy, oh boy, The Uncle. This episode is such an anomaly, giving us one of the best songs of the entire season, but it's also so bad. All right, so Ocho, we all know Ocho, the intense 8-bit spider. Well, he ends up revealing one day to Gumball and Darwin that his uncle is Mario. Like actual fire spitting, star grabbing, tax evading Mario. And Gumbo really, really wants to meet Mario. So just because of this, he becomes best friends with Ocho to get closer to his family. This ends up being a terrible idea because meeting Mario wasn't all it cut out to be and becoming friends with Ocho was way, way worse of a deal than he ever thought it would be. Getting into fights and doing extreme rituals to test your friendship. Oh yeah, and he can't get out of the friendship once he starts it. And once Gumbo has to prove himself as Ocho's real friend, there's this fight scene with some bullies and a really, for some reason, extreme kidnapping scene where Gumball is traumatized thinking he was about to commit suicide? Who are you? What do you want? You took Ocho from me! Now you're gonna have to make a choice! What? What do you mean? Choose between yourself and Ocho! One of you has to go! Option A, jump and I spare him! Option B, don't jump and he goes down! So what's your answer? Time! Choose! Now! Ah! Huh? Good choice. A true friend always puts the other before himself. Also funny prank, right? You really got me there. And then there's this demonic looking ritual that leads to something prevalent in this section of the show. Darwin is no longer my best friend? Best friendship is begun with Ocho? Memes. So in season four, the worst episode that season, in my opinion, was The Girlfriend. The episode where Darwin gets trapped in a one-sided abusive relationship with Jamie because she wanted a boyfriend and Darwin was too afraid to say no. Well, now here in The Uncle, Gumball gets into an intense one-sided abusive relationship with Ocho because, well... Mom! This episode just feels the same as The Girlfriend, just reskin with more memes and video game references. But the thing is, I still can't say I find it the worst, because just look at it. The amount of goofy animation changes and silly jokes they shove into here, I found a lot of them funny. And the most memorable part of this episode for a lot of people, the song to Ocho, still slaps to this day. I get it. Too intense, right? If I had to rate my stress on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd score a... <laughs> But I couldn't deal when it came to the rest of this one, man. Number 29, The Weirdo. So it took five seasons, but this is the first and only Gumball episode where Sussy is a major character. So throughout the series, we've known Sussy as this weird chin girl that gets bullied and name called all the time by bullies and people who take advantage of her being weird. And after Gumball and Darwin see these bullies take advantage of her, they try to help her originally by getting her to change and be more normal. Now it's the same old sussy antics that we've seen throughout the entire show at this point, but something changes here. When Sussy tells them that she doesn't need to change anything about her life, and then gets a chance to show the boys how she sees the world. And it turns out to be much more magical and colorful and carefree than our normal world. <laughs> Decision to make the world my vision 
and it teaches the boys how beautiful and nice and friendly the world is to her and why she's the way she is why she's so friendly to everyone despite them being completely rude and mean to her now throughout the entirety of the show so far i could say with confidence that i didn't like sussy this episode changed that now i hated whenever sussy came on screen because it wasn't even her being like weird or different it's it's just because whenever she came on it would be more lazy and predictable joke every time she came around you knew she would either say something weird or random for someone else to make fun of her or she'd rub something on her face and make a weird noise and to take that character and show her individual perspective on the world and explain why she is the way he is and also shine some light on mental illness uh i think it was really nice i still didn't really like the beginning as i had the same sort of sussy jokes as i expected but being sussy's first and only episode i think they did this the best way they could possibly do it number 30 the heist richard stupidly and accidentally robs a bank in a motorcycle helmet as he thinks he's just ordering from joyful burger and once he goes back home the watersons are now technically felons as richard stole two million dollars that they have to somehow return they then spend the rest of the episode brainstorming ways how to get the cash back in this rightful place the early police chase and the ideas that they brainstorm are really all creative and reference a different type of movie or scenario my favorite being nicole's image of doing some mission impossible action and jumping from panel to panel but other than just sitting around in this alley nothing happens until darwin actually returns the money and the cops think that this package is like a bomb so they blow it all up we're gonna do a controlled explosion no oh, man, two million dollars. You know how many Reaper Vandals I could have bought with that? 31 is the singing. You know, a lot of people hate musicals and musical episodes and cartoons, but I don't think this one will get on people's nerves. It's pretty good. We take a journey through Elmore with this repetitive melody at the beginning as we see parodies of various music genres with various characters singing their songs. Some of the actual parodies that come later on in the episode are good. I just don't really like the main song that plays here. Everyone has a rhyme and they sing like this the whole time. They're all singing. So things may seem blue but what does that matter to you when you're singing hey don't you ever knock you're too loud keep it down or you'll wake everybody in town with your singing Aww. and they parody other genres like terry singing some k-pop about germs or billy doing his sophisticated rap and even though it made me deeply uncomfortable to get close-ups of miss simian's body like this i'll admit i was kind of enjoying principal brown's r&b song steve i said how okay my sweet you haven't said a word since we got here. What? You interrupted me to say that? I was right in the middle of a Shh. There's no need to feel insecure. You got something those other girls don't have. Thick hair all over your body. Now just lie down and listen. Nigel, I'm not going to lie down in a restaurant. You're a hairy lady. Hair from your head to your toes. Girl. You're a hairy lady. Why is that so catchy? Why is that so catchy? I'm gonna be singing that in the shower now. Number 32, the best. Carmen, the cactus girl, is a good person, okay? A very good person. Such a good person that she feels the need to point out that she's a good person and point out other people's flaws when they didn't ask. And when Gumball gets virtue signaled by Carmen in the school cafeteria, he gets annoyed at her not minding her own business. And even though, you know, I realize she's just trying to help, she's doing it in a really annoying way. So, to prove Carmen's not the best person, Gumball goes to the extreme. What's going on here? Uh, he asked me to plug him into Rambler. Rambler? What is that, a website? It's more like a bare knuckle fight to see who's the most tolerant person on the internet. Why? Isn't tolerance about being philanthropic? <laughs> With the help of Darwin, Gumball downloads all of Rambler into his head and basically becomes Twitter as a person, downloading all of the passiveness, aggressiveness, and arguments of the internet to defeat Carmen in a social justice debate. Have you ever tried whole grain bread? It's far better for you. Not everyone can afford organic stores, Carmen. Maybe you should check your privilege. Ah! Oh, I just meant that eating too much processed food is a big factor in weight gain, and I... And what? Big people shouldn't be proud of who they are? Oh, no, of course not. I mean, ask your doctor and he will tell you. He? Why would you assume the doctor is he? Is it because you assume a woman can't be a doctor? Oh, what is this? I have studied the martial ways of the social justice warrior. Fight me in an argument if you dare. Perish under the sword of my self-righteousness. But Gumball, exploiting those powers to win some petty argument will just hurt the cause of the people who really need our help. Wait, no, my powers! Instead of fighting, why don't we just hug it out? Wait, stop! What are you doing? I forgive you. No! The shame I cast! It's all coming back at me! Ah! And I can't even be angry about it. 
about it. After losing this argument, he resorts to trying to dig up old files about Carmen's past and send it to everyone to prove that she isn't a good person. I love it. I love it, dude. I love all of it. Uh, this episode's portrayal of the current dynamic of the internet. These are the type of internet episodes that I like where, you know, what is being shown in them is still kind of current today. And you could technically root for both sides in this episode, as either characters are likable or relatable. And Gumball going back to dig up dirt after losing an argument, that's that's just a truer right there. That's just true. And someone in the writer's room must have been pulling it funny, as they must have planned this out, since this one's called the best and is one of the best of the season, while the next is 100% one of the worst. Number 33, the worst. The whole Watterson family had a terrible day. Nicole comes home mad about being mistreated at the workplace because she's a woman. Gumball and Darwin are mad because they're men and toxic masculinity affects them every day. Anais is upset coming home being stressed about being a kid, while Richard is upset at the stress of being an adult. Why? Because being a woman is the worst. It's like playing one of your video games without the... the... the stick of happiness! Do you mean the joystick? No, I meant... So, to prove who actually has the worst struggle between them, they all switch lives for a day. And they all go through exactly what they complain about in each person's shoes. After turning 40... <laughs> Random parts of your body start to hurt horribly for no reason, and there's no cure. Have a nice grown-up day. We're just giving in to the extreme pressure to conform to completely unattainable standards of beauty. <laughs> I didn't even shave today. I washed three parts of my body with a damp face cloth, and I'm good to go. Wow, I never realized how little time guys spend looking after themselves. And once they all get home, they had another terrible day and come to the conclusion that life just sucks for everyone sometimes. This episode's no fun. They whine, you see the family get dunked on by life, you get to see it again, they whine again, the end. And I get the message they're trying to show here. You shouldn't spend your time complaining about your life or compare your struggle to someone else's until you've taken a walk in their shoes. But nah, this is just it just takes the whole point of the show here being a fun and imaginative show and goes, nah, let's just let's just not do that this time. Yes, we're all agreed. Everyone Everyone has it equally bad. Well, no. Actually, there are some real imbalances that- Exactly. Turns out everyone has it the worst. No, no, that's the problem. Men just don't listen. Women always get cut off in the middle of their- <laughs> Number 34, The Deal. After Nicole scores Employee of the Month at her job, she becomes absolutely obsessed with that accomplishment to the point where she's the only person she cares about anymore. Richard then starts to feel a little bit underappreciated and goes on strike from parenting until Nicole finally acknowledges what he does around the house too. He never gets celebrations at home, so why does she? It really feels like Nicole's trying to turn their relationship into a competition. And even though it really looks like a no contest, how Richard looks like he's lazy and doesn't do anything around the house, once Richard stops parenting, the kids are left to their natural states and things get pretty messy pretty quick no don't you dare that's a precious family heirloom then they haven't got round to selling online yet <laughs> as the kids turn into literal monsters. So Richard has to go back in and calm them down before they hurt everyone around them. The reference to the Goonies while here in the house and Jurassic Park while Richard's trying to calm them all down are all cool. And once Richard actually has the solutions to calm all the kids down, it has a cute and wholesome ending with Nicole and Richard together. Number 35, the petals. Ah, Leslie, the flower with the questionable sexuality and a love for beauty and fashion. But the problem is Leslie is starting to wilt and become uglier and uglier, losing his pretty boy presence. Not really knowing how to deal with himself, Gumball and Darwin try to help him get his shine back, but end up doing their Gumball and Darwin thing and ruin everything. And every attempt they do to make Leslie prettier just ends up making it worse and worse to the point where they're pretty much threatening to kill him. The boys have a lot of good bits in this one, including Darwin trying to be nice, but ending up just being so savage. Don't worry, we'll help you get pretty again. Thank you. Hm. Sorry. It's just... Your face. God damn. He ain't getting up from that one. He ain't getting up from that. Why you doing like that? But the message of his beauty being seriously that important and just seeing Leslie deteriorate and get tortured time and time again, uh, wasn't really all that fun. The good bits couldn't fully save the episode for me as I felt like I was just watching another 
Torture fest. Number 36, the puppets. We've all had the point in our lives where we need to get rid of our old toys because, you know, we're getting too old. We're getting we're getting too old to play with dolls. At least let me keep my Pikachu plushie. No! Ah! And here we get to see the boys in their attic trying to get rid of their old stuff, but they end up finding Darwin's favorite old puppets. And as soon as he sees them again, he feels the exact same obsession, which end up taking over his life again, and he brings them everywhere. To the toilet, in the bath, on the school bus. Sitting here wondering what went wrong with mine while eating cheese. Well, one ticket to Kiss Town, please. Why is Rocky immediately ready to make out with the song? But Darwin keeps on acting like these puppets are alive, and Gumball just thinks he's insane, so he throws him away again. But it's in the middle of the night that we as the viewers realize that Darwin wasn't exactly lying when he said the puppets were actually alive. And the puppets crawl back in the house, hop on Darwin's hands again, and take possession over his body. And to save his brother from the puppet clutches, Gumball has to go into their world by putting on the third one and quote-unquote playing with them. And oh baby, what an animation change. So as many of you know, this section was animated in collaboration with the team behind don't hug me i'm scared the youtube horror mini series that's made a comeback recently and i think it's really cool that they managed to work with the big studio and managed to get on a really popular tv show like gumball and you could see the horror influence in this puppet section in the surreal way they portrayed these characters frank and howdy it's your turn to the will never torment Darwin wanting nothing but fun 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 and trying to convince him that their world is nothing but fun but instead they want to keep him there forever and never that's until Gumball shows up trying to save his friend and he gets trapped too god damn it. but after a small music sequence by a thread the boys are able to escape the puppets running away and disabling them I'm not gonna knock points for this but instead I'm gonna give it more points for the fact that I wish this section was longer the rest of the episode that played out before and after this this puppet section was good but this felt world defined the creepiness and dread and this episode stood out. Number 37, The Nuisance. The Watersons get an anonymous invite to a social gathering where they end up meeting uh, 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 um, this totally random billionaire that wants to gentrify Elmore by making it more suitable to rich people and kicking out all the poor people so he can raise the land of the price and make more money, money, money. And the step one of doing this would be to get out any problem causers out of the neighborhood that are bringing Elmore's value down, which everyone in the town can unanimously agree is the water sense. So their first plan is that they try to appeal to everyone in the neighborhood by looking better than they actually are. You know, doing chores around the town, trying to look good on the paper, and all around change the their public image, which ends up literally and horrifyingly transforming their actual images. It worked, Mother. Our efforts succeeded. Everyone in the town loves us. <laughs> 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 And they all end up metamorphing into a normal British family. And so, after trying to transform themselves didn't work, uh, they then realize that the only thing that they could do instead of transforming themselves is to transform the entire neighborhood. So they want to make Elmore so bad that this man can't sell it anymore. So they go around trying to make Elmore into a more dangerous hood than it already was. Genius plan! And here they realize that there are some things that money truly can't buy. But I really like the plans that the Watersons had, and that transformation scene was... Wow. Talk about making an episode memorable. Jeez. Number 38, The Line. A new screening of an epic space movie is premiering today, and even after camping out all night, the Watersons are still only at the back of the line, which turns out will give them terrible seats in the theater. So they have to slowly work their way up the line by convincing the person in front of them to go back behind. So they end up getting various people to leave with different strategies, like, like giving people fake spoilers to the movie so they don't feel the need to see it anymore. Uh, dude, I can't wait to see this movie. I know, it's so exciting. Anything could happen. Yeah, anything. As long as they keep it exactly the same as it was in the first three movies and nothing changes at all. I want surprises, but, you know, only the ones I expect. <gasps> the first review's online! 
What up, Elmore streamers? It's Dolly Boy 1923, aka Pixel Donkey. I just got back from seeing Stellar Odyssey: Cold in the Force rehash. No spoilers, but it's so refreshing to see less CGI space battles and more sock puppets. And what a brave decision it was to recast all the main characters as female, including the robots. Ah! Oh, I can't believe it! They ruined the whole franchise. Dude, that was my phone. You could have just stopped the video. Everybody should go like and subscribe to Pixel Donkey, by the way. So shout out to him. I'll leave a link to Pixel Donkey's channel in the description. But besides the funny YouTuber bit, I honestly really enjoyed this episode, even though it was just a load of Star Wars references. And as someone who hasn't watched any Star Wars movie yet, I was still able to get some of the references they were going for. And I was hyped for the race at the end where they had to race to a whole different theater to see the movie. Number 39, the list. So the boys sort of realized that their mom kind of gave up on all their dreams to have them. After talking to her one day, they find an old list of Nicole's hopes and dreams, and they decide that they're going to do all of Nicole's chores and things around the house so she can do everything on her dreams list. But it doesn't really end up working out as they accidentally end up doing her dreams list. And after they do her list of hopes, they show Nicole that, you know, maybe she can still follow her dreams and they're still possible. Even traveling around the world like she wants to do. Which they then have a cute scene where they go around Elmore Maps and explore the world like Nicole always wanted to do. Welcome to the 21st century. Uh, guys, I have been outside our house before. Ah, just wait a minute, Mom. Oh, that was fast. Oh, look, there's our car up ahead. Pedal to the metal. Oh, look, it's Mr. Dad. <laughs> no, 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 I really wish he'd watch where he's... Oh. This is a slower, more wholesome episode, and I say that while there's a scene of a dude getting choked by crystals, but I do like this sort of calmer tone that was set for the episode, with bits like the Google Maps section, and at this point it didn't really feel like a normal cartoon, it felt like you were just sort of chilling with the family. It felt very relaxing and very cozy. And episode 40, the news, where we get to look into Elmore's Channel 6 news! <laughs> the other one theme episodes they just dump all their news jokes here there's not really a cohesive story here there's just a bunch of bit after bit after bit so i'll just throw in my favorite bits here the section where the news station runs out of news so i have to scramble to throw in any filler by interviewing anybody sir what do you think about it what i think of what you you haven't asked me anything and you sir any thoughts I was really hoping that would take longer. Just feels like a bit straight out of the office, doesn't it? Sorry if I'm not a hard sell, but just not much else to say except for the jokes hitting perfectly on this one. Fun, goofy episode making fun of the news. Back to you, RT. Thanks, RT. This is my final ranking for season five, and let's move on to the final season of Gumball as of 2022, season six. We're coming up on a brief intermission here to tell you to stay hydrated. That's all I wanted to say. Enjoy season six. Biggest season of Gumball out of whopping 44 episodes. All to simply wrap up the series in a neat little bow. Definitely one of the strangest seasons of Gumball, even stranger than its predecessor. And I, I just want to get into it. Starting with episode one, The Rival. This episode takes place four years ago when Anais was first brought into the world and got to meet her two brothers, which will be immediate minute upon seeing them. She attempts to literally murder them. Boys? Say hello to your little sister. Hey! This turns into a trend of trying to get them kicked out of the family or just straight up kicked out of life. Some of these moments are genuinely getting out of hand. There's no way Anais would have pushed us out of the car on purpose. You know why? Because all babies are born innocent. And if you thought all babies were born innocent, check out these baby sharks eating each other before they're even born. 
So Darn and Gumball try to like neutralize her by putting her in this box and shipping her away. But the box isn't picked up by anyone to ship it, it's picked up by a garbage man to go to the garbage dump to get sliced up and burned. Not knowing that Anais is not actually in it, they just assume she's there and try to save her from being jumped. Now, I know that they made Anais here sort of a gremlin sort of demon child to make a joke about how certain animals give birth and their babies try to kill each other. I didn't really get it at first. So they literally say it in the episode. It's not the fact that I didn't get it, it's the fact that I didn't really find it all that entertaining. But I think this first episode is one big way to show off the shift and the amount of quality and more budget and more everything that Gumball has. Look at the amount of cool visual gags and animated faces. I think all the slapstick and the smooth animation is really cool and the lighting is incredible, but the rest of this episode, the story was Nah, I wasn't really feeling it. Number two, the lady. From the looks of it today, seems like it could be a normal day. You know, school ends up getting canceled after multiple teachers ate these candles. And so the boys need to get back home early. But once they open the front door, they're met with... Random lady who's then switched out with Richard with the ominous red stain on his lips. Richard tries to explain how that was his personal trainer and usually the boys don't get home this early and, and, and uh, they know what's up. Richard is secretly living a double life and the boys have to confront him about it because it's ruining the family. This is messed up, man. How the hell do you even end up cheating on Nicole? We know about Samantha. Oh, well... I guess you were bound to find out one day. How do you feel about it? Oh, just great! How do you think Mom would feel about it? Well, she's not around in the day. I've got to find some way of keeping myself entertained. Entertained?! Is it so bad that I have some fun? I enjoy the time I spend with my girls. Girls? Plural?! But despite his descriptions alluding to it, Richard isn't hiding someone, but is instead hiding something about himself. Richard's in the drag! After Gummo and Darwin stalk down this lady that they think their dad is cheating on their mom with, it turns out that there's no cheating going on, that is literally him! And it turns out that, like, Richard only did this to get friends with this group of sassy old women. And Richard just wanted friends the whole time, but he ended up lucking out because all these women are just like him! They're all in drag too! I get it, okay, I get it. Secretly two-timing and secretly cheating is gross. But the idea that Richard, of all people, could possibly be cheating and him trying to pull that off is funny as hell. And this episode is cool because in the past they've alluded to Richard being into dressing in feminine stuff or liking feminine things and now they actually did a whole plot around it. You're gonna see that more and more times this season where they bring back something from the past and try their best to do it better and newer and cooler. Episode 3 the sucker. A whole episode where Darwin is a major character and Gumball doesn't show up for one second? I'll take your entire stock. Hey, you know those tweets popping up recently about people's favorite like ship dynamics? Seeing those reminded me that this is one of my favorite duo dynamics in cartoons and definitely one of my favorites in gumball where you know you got the darker edgier thug that's nothing but trouble and then you got the sweet and innocent gift to the world by their side darwin gets detention after vandalizing school property and it's here in detention where he meets julius the bomb bully guy that he only had direct interaction with in season two julius actually tries to take advantage of darwin's niceness calling him a sucker and he thinks that he's easily manipulatable which he turned out to be uh, kind of half right after trying to boss darwin around to do illegal things and pranks for him, he ruins literally every aspect of his life by doing everything he said wrong. He ends up losing his crew, his house, his girlfriend. That's until Darwin helps him out in the end and teaches him a valuable lesson about bullying people. Teaching how all this karma could come back at you hard. And I don't know which crazy dude in the writing room thought this up, but having Darwin pair up with a character that's the complete opposite of him was such a good idea. That made for a fantastically unique episode. I know the show's named after him, but every episode without gumball in it ends up so memorable not just because they're rare but they're usually really good i'm a little sad that this took six seasons but i'm i, I really wish we saw more just darwin centered episodes without gumball interrupting episode four the vegging it's the boys day off and they just want to chill and veg out and watch tv for the entire day until distractions start to pop up all around them that almost try to ruin their veg time and they have to continuously ignore the world and tune out everything around them even though some crazy strange things are starting to happen you need to get out there's a 
meteorite in direct collision course with Elmore. So there's some space scientists outside. Big deal. We just wait until our brains tune it out. Nothing will move them. Not an alien invasion, not a middle-aged man in a schoolgirl outfit, nothing. See, it simply went away. Who the who is that? Ito makibaki, ito makibaki, ito, ito, ton, ton, ton. I think we should stop tuning things out. I'm kind of losing the plot here. Meh. Until the two are basically forced to leave their house when they see their family dangling off a bridge and they're technically the only ones that can save them. So they rush over there, it's still still in their chairs of course, and eventually get close enough to save the car from falling with the power of laziness. Yeah, this episode's premise is relatable and all, but seeing the world crumble around the two makes this one really interesting and notable and sets you up for events you might see in the rest of the season. Not to mention this message they're given at the end. This is a message from the future. The strange things that happened today were for a reason and it was all the work of oh my gosh darwin who could be sending that message no i mean i just wrote couch candy that's nah, <laughs> probably nothing episode five the one this has got to be the best we've seen of gumball and darwin's relationship so far <laughs> I'm so weak that if I was a superhero, I'd be boy man. The man with the strength of a 12-year-old boy. What are you talking about? You're as strong as a bear. Naked old lady. <laughs> <laughs> I got so little muscle definition, I need a muscle dictionary. <laughs> they start joking around with each other and ribbing at themselves. And this made me notice how much these two have developed over the seasons and how they actually feel like bros now. Don't get me wrong. They always had that feeling like they were brothers and they were connected and they loved each other. But it is not until now that they have been more real than this because this is just what actually hanging with your bro is like it's also realistic how when one person joins in on the ribbing that's not a bro things get a little weird i don't have a sex pack i have a barrel yeah your mix section looks like someone tried to shove a grapefruit through a garden hose <laughs> <laughs> yeah man your belly has more folds than an origami convention unexpectedly tobias joins in as well into joking around about gum all darwin but they're not close enough to really feel comfortable with him saying these jokes. My honest reaction. The boys realize that Tobias is only acting like he's close to them to feed his own selfish urges to be one of the main characters. We've seen this before in the last season, in the episodes even before that, where he was basically just ready to insert himself and try to become the main character at whatever point he could. Dude, who invited you in? What am I, a vampire? <laughs> it's what friends do. By the way, can you tell your mom to buy more ice cream? We're out. But Gumball lets him know that there is no possible way that you are going to be the best friend of the main character or be the main character. And the way it formulates in Tobias's brain is that as long as there's friends above him, he cannot succeed to number one. So he challenges all of Gumball's friends to a battle to decide who will be the last friend standing. And he goes through just folding people, bro. This giant sword he pulls on Leslie. My man became guts to kill a flower. So he ends up actually terminating all of his other friends. The last boss he has to defeat is Darwin. This isn't really how friendship works, uh, so Gumball tries to remind him of that until Tobias reveals that with every one of Gumball's friends he's defeated, he's absorbed their powers. Creative ways he executed everyone still remains to be one of my favorite, like, sequences in Gumball for how absurd it gets at points. <laughs> And I'm glad they brought back Tobias for the season because he's evolved so much as a character since he was first introduced. And I think they have stopped having many ideals with him. That's why he hasn't really been showing up as a major character in a lot of these. But it's cool to see him pop up once in a while with a banger episode. Oh my god, number six, the father. All right, bro. So after inviting Frankie back over to his house, Frankie realizes that he can't make it up to Richard and his mom. As we already know, years ago, Frankie abandoned the two to go and live a different life. So after going to a quote unquote celebration, for him set up by the family, he walks out on them again. And we've realized this before, but only now it's hammered into our heads how bad Richard's daddy issues are. This man so desperately desires his father's affection that the boys and NIE set up for them to meet and fulfill all their father-son activities that they missed out on when Richard was little. The final detail and the special factor though about this episode is how human it makes the characters in Gumbo feel. Okay, I think that's enough. What? What did I do wrong? It's no good. I thought this would be a father and son bonding thing. You know, we talk about life. Oh, that's cool. Let's do that now. Oh, look, son. You know what I'm like. I'm the vermin man. I'm no role model. 
I'm more of a parole model. <laughs> oh. Look, I didn't want you to turn out like me. And I was right. Look at you. You turned out great. And your kids love you. I didn't start off as a good father. But your kids, they see you as better than you are. So every day you bust your chops and try to live up to that. It's too late for me. No, not true. You know what my kids taught me today? The future starts now. I'm sorry, son. I'm sorry, too. I feel like this could be a real conversation. The timing, the vocab, it doesn't really sound like they're just people reading scripts. They're actually talking, bro. Good dialogue can really carry any sort of cartoon or show a long way. And that was showcased really well here, in my opinion. The best episode with Grandpa Frankie, for sure, as they make up their bond. Episode 7. <laughs> The cringe hot dog guys back. Yeah, baby doing the same episode three times. Let's go So after months of avoiding each other gumball bumps into hot dog guy Which leads into another awkward and cringy encounter, but things get more suspicious than ever like this shower scene One two three BAM damn shower. How's that for awkward? What? Just realize you are very much wearing shorts so, what's the problem? If anything, it makes it more awkward. Uh, yeah, for me. Uh, this won't work if we can't reach full cringe. It's like a hot air balloon trying to take off. It's never gonna happen if one of the guys is still wearing his pants. Wait, what? Come on, man, take them off! No way. Just take them off! Leave her. Just take off your clothes! What? Joe! Yeah. Uh are you good? Is this a pivotal moment in Joe's childhood? Is he realizing something about himself? This time is different because Gumball and Hot Dog Guy are so fed up with all this weird awkwardness. There's gotta be a reason why these two are always so disturbing around each other. So they hatch a plan to destroy the awkwardness once and for all by creating a moment so awkward it encompasses every other awkward moment they've ever had, which only leads to things pretty much getting worse. As Gumball literally becomes his stepdad. Good evening, honey. Ah! Do it your mom! Do it, do it your mom! And even though I hate to admit it, bro, Gumball has mastered this sort of cringe comedy. And I I'm convinced now more than ever that they can make any situation as awkward as possible, but at the same time as hilarious as possible. Just like that shower scene. There's then this section where they get into a magical box and go back in time all the way back in their childhood to see if there's any repressed disturbing memories between the two. They look back and they start to see that they've actually known each other since they were born. They go way Way, way back and it was a really weird twist but it was fun to see the animation and destruction of the sets after they're destroying these memories and once again i gotta say it's the best episode out of a series of episodes season six is on a goddamn roll episode eight the cage mr cornet is a character we've seen pop up a lot in the later seasons but we've never really learned or said anything about and i gotta say in about the nine minutes of screen time he has in this episode he has quickly become one of my favorite characters <gasps> Mr. Cornet, your face, what happened? Pretty mama, handsome daddy. No, I meant your black guy. <laughs> you should see the other guys. Hi, Mr. Cornet! <laughs> I cannot stress strongly enough, these are not the other guys. He is the chillest frog on the planet. He's smooth with his words, his voice is softer than my goddamn pillows. He's just great all around. Although he gets into a bit of a bind when he goes up to the school's nurse and lies about being an MMMA fighter. This was after he got an injury doing some very mundane activity, but he wants to win the nurse's heart. And Gumball and Darwin over here, this, they want him to go big. Okay, you see, Elmore Jr. High is running so low on cash that they had to combine establishments with the literal prison. So Mr. Cornet, to save the school, he can compete in the worldwide MMMMA octagon to win enough money to save the school. And no one believes he can do it. Probably because he's seriously weak and underdeveloped and hasn't had his muscles exercised in like seven years. <laughs> But turns out that doubt was the final ingredient to finally complete the recipe. It's not that we don't believe in you. It's that we know you can't win. Of course I can! How? Show us! How on earth are you gonna hit this guy? With my heart! Like this! Just leave me to it. And don't bother coming. Through the power of his heart, with the whole school riding on his shoulders, Mr. Cornet steps up to the plate, lays a kiss on the nurse, and he goes for it against the greatest fighter in the world. Kids, 
Thank you for believing in me when I didn't even believe in myself. And the reason I didn't believe in myself was because I knew I was lying all along. Wait, what? I'm not a fighter. I just lied because I wanted to smooch the nerves. It's a really good thing that Gummo made a deal with the showrunners to get enough money even if Cornet lost. Cause god damn, this makes me wish Mr. Cornet had a more major role in some episodes. Uh, like I feel this, like his chill attitude balances out like the sheer chaos that is the show sometimes. Episode 9, The Faith. It's been so long, but we finally got a Gumball and Alan episode that doesn't involve Gumball hating Alan's guts. This episode is similar to the pizza from season 2, that episode where Larry quit all of his jobs in Elmore. Well here the same thing happens, but now with Alan. The balloon who was once a ray of happiness, sunshine, and evil intentions to start concentration camps, we don't talk about those, though, has quit volunteering around Elmore as now, well, he's lost faith in the world. He thinks to himself, what's the point of even trying to make the world a better place when no matter what he tries, the negative parts of life will never change, and him being drained leaves the whole world draining of its life and happiness as well. So first, the boys try to reinforce to Alan that this is just how life is. Because there's war and fighting and the bad guy often wins. So you have to find some comfort in the smallest little things They're shouting and they're stealing There are mortgages to pay But that's a grown up thing and you are still a kid today You know, it's gonna suck sometimes and you just gotta deal with it Which only makes things worse and makes them even sadder Until the second verse hits And oh my god Listen to Alan flex the pipes here Tell me how's all that supposed to make me feel better If you stop halfway up the mountain, you will never see the view. When you look out far, you'll climb, you'll find no courage to pull through. You'll wonder how on earth you can put up with all of this. Then you'll come across a memory of perfect bliss. So keep following the light, no matter how much your heart aches. Cause this sad old world will lead your home. What the boys focus more on now in this song is how, yeah, life isn't perfect, nothing is. It just even though it sometimes can weigh it down on you from how bad it can feel in some points, what's the point in even giving up? You've come all this way to see what's next. You've climbed half the mountain already. You gotta climb the rest so you can be satisfied with the view. You don't know if there's something beautiful out there waiting for you until you go and find it. You just gotta keep pushing and striving for better. And even in the darkest moments of the most unfortunate people's lives, there's still beauty in the world that can bring some light into their lives. Ah, oh, this show's goddamn so good. Easily one of the top episodes so far. I'm not even gonna lie. That song kind of carried. <laughs> Episode 10, The Candidate. The whole class gets stuck in a small school room after their parents accidentally raise the temperature and lock them in the room while they go and party. There's then discord amongst who actually gets to eat any of the food while they're stuck in the room, and it turns into a bunch of infighting. So they need guidance. They hold an election to see who will lead them through this entire disaster. It took us nine whole episodes to finally get to one that wasn't all that crazy. The issue here is mostly just with the jokes. While there's some interesting political stances in here, like Banana Joe being full-on red pill, they, they also seem to be going for a more current approach with this episode's humor. Using that some of that sweet Gen Z slang, like woke, lit, and on fleek. Which, you know, hearing those words unironically is medically proven to give you premature hemorrhoids. And all this discourse leads up to the point where, because Gumball led the entire room into this sort of anarchy, they all end up fighting each other and busting out of the room themselves. <laughs> Us back to now. Hey, I'm the green screen interrupting guy. Cool part comes in when every single student here has to use one of their abilities to escape the currently burning school. Tobias is money, Rachel sass. I think the only bad part of this episode was really that sort of outdated humor, which really wasn't even the fault of the show. So this episode was okay, personally, just not really that memorable. So 11 the anybody. Clayton's back for a seasonal episode, right? Here we find out that, like Tobias, Clayton really, really wants to be in the cool adventures with 
with Gumball and Darwin. But every single time he's been there, he's been as an inanimate object that you can't really get in as a main character. Life's just been boring for him, you know? And this led to the worst possible thing that could ever happen to anything. Gumball gave him advice. Okay, then I'll be Darwin. So, what are we gonna do? I do not sound like that. Try clearing your throat. Okay. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's better. Dude, you're wasting your talent. If nothing cool happens to you, why not just change into someone else? If I've learned one thing from movies, it's that the key to happiness is never be yourself. Bro. D didn't Robert do this exact same thing in season one? Do you think this could end well at all? Well, surprise, surprise, it did not. Clayton goes hog wild, just copying everyone in Elmore, putting the lives of many people in jeopardy as he ruins relationships left and right. And the boys have to chase him down and get him to stop. They go through sewers, through a movie theater, all to track him down while he's disguised as Gumball. But uh, in the end, it's actually him who ends up finally saving Gumball, as him and Gumball decide to do a switcheroo in the movie theater. Now, Clayton's a good little character, bro. I love this guy, but he's never really used in the most interesting ways. What I'm trying to say here is that Clayton's personality is fine, his powers are cool as hell, but he's never really used. He's never the main character he wants to be. He never uses his powers in really interesting ways. So yeah, I thought this one was okay and goofy to give Clayton his own time to shine. Episode 12, The Pact. After his car broke down, Principal Brown has to awkwardly take a ride on the school bus next to the rest of the kids and ends up sitting next to Gumball. Not awkward at all. To which then he decides to have some girl talk with a 13 year old boy. Like the time they almost did in a tent, but they didn't do it that time. Principal Brown explains how Miss Simeon's morning breath is always terrible and is causing issues in the two's relationship. And Gumball explains his problem, how Penny's laugh is now terrible. But these two are both too scared to tell their partners how they really feel from fear of getting actually killed. Yo, these guys are kind of winning, bro. I... <sighs> I just need me, I just need me a shoddy that can just kill me at any second. So they make a pact with each other to help each other out by solving each other's girl issues. Once Gumball manages to barely fix Miss Simeon's bad breath issue, it's now time for Principal Brown to hold up his side of the deal. But him being the conniving snake that he is, he decides he isn't gonna keep up his end of the deal. So Gumball has to get him to cooperate and help out by telling Miss Simeon his little secret. And we get this really cool scene of Gumball running through remote controlled halls trying to get to Miss Simeon, threatening Brown, and eventually once he makes it to a office, he saves the day by broadcasting his voice throughout the entire intercom of the school, exposing him to everyone. I still really enjoy the execution of this one. I, I gotta say, it's so refreshing to see Gumball becoming less and less of a wimpy pushover loser. I mean, don't get me wrong, he still is, like, a lot of the time, but, like, more and more you start to see these moments of him actually standing up for himself and being strong. And that development, mixed with this funny, good episode, makes me very happy, man. Number 13, The Neighbor. You see this man right here. Do you know this man's name? You've definitely seen him before. He's been in Gumball many, many times. Who is he? Well, if you don't know, that's fine because Gumball and Darwin don't know either. And they finally get around to getting to know the name of the mailman who's been their neighbor they've known for years. But it'd be way too awkward for them to just ask for his name after knowing him for so long. So they try to find a way, other ways around that. <laughs> I hereby state that I, Alice and Sandra Gator, do take you as my lawful wedded husband. Okay, your turn. Go! Uh, I hereby state that I... Yes? I... Yes? I... I think this is all happening too fast! And they end up meeting some shady dogs that are hunting him down. Turns out his real life name is Gary Hedges, but he's been going under the pseudonym to hide away from his past. Harry Gadget, and he's trying to escape from whoever the hell these people are trying to murder him. Bro, why does everyone in Elmore have some kind of criminal or shady backstory? Kind of getting old at this point. Gary is a likable enough character. There's not much I can really say about him since he was just kind of an old dude running from his past. He seems to be similar to other elder characters like Marvin Fingelheimer. So yeah, honestly, this one was all right. Episode 14, The Shippening. Dude, I think you were right. I don't see how this day could get any weird. Here we go. Ah! What the? Dude! This is all messed up! I know, right? I mean, future me wearing sandals? I mean, you're gonna steal Carrie from me! It's supposed to be car win, not car ball! You home wrecking woman eater! And it looks like I didn't stop at women. 
What in God's name is a fourth wall? After the awesome store gets caught up with police and chased down, he drops something out of the back of his van that Sarah ends up picking up. Now, the awesome store has a bunch of magical items that can do crazy things in Gumball's universe, and it just so happens that this notebook is special as well. When Sarah writes in it, thinking that she just got a new place to write her fanfiction, the things that she's writing down start to become canon. And even the language of the fanfic literally starts materializing into reality. A lonely young girl called Terry. She she lived her life in the safety zone, but there's no medication for falling head over heels in love. Alan rushed over. <gasps> Did it hurt? Alan said, the gentle light glistening on his chiseled features. Not as much as all these years of yearning for you, she said, her heart in her mouth. Without further ado, they kissed, their lips crashing into each other, forever oblivious to the world around them. The point where Gumball and Darwin start to figure out is when they meet their OC counterparts. Hi! Who are you? I'm your cousin, Zachariah Lopez Kirby! I have a hyper mood and I like paragliding and ducks! I hate arguments and itchy hats! Mm. Uh, right. And I'm Zachariah's girlfriend, Bexy. It's shot for Alexandra. Backstory? I was raised by my uncle, Chimiche, and his twin dogs, Ramir and Castro. Catchphrase. This bird is out of control! Okay. This is just too real. This, this just actually exists. I like how after seeing this, they just immediately know it was Sarah, so they rush to her house. They show her what she's been writing has been affecting the whole town and that the police are after her as they saw her pick it up after it fell out of the awesome store. So they gotta set everything back to normal before the police get in and take the script away. This episode reminded me of the copycats where the topic of the episode was something very, very real and very, very weird. And I gotta acknowledge real quick the improvement of Sarah as a character. Sarah doesn't really feel like this a sort of annoying stalker character anymore but now she feels like an actual friend of the boys she's someone who's socially inept and doesn't really know how to express herself properly but at least now she's actually trying to help instead of trying on the boys clothes when they're not looking i'm sorry but this is moving too fast for me <gasps> this bird is out of control really struggling to think of what to say without just showing you the clips because because the best thing about this entire episode is the amount of jokes they throw in and how they're executed like i don't think i could do this justice by just talking about it you gotta go watch this this bird is out of control number 15 the brain and ends up in the hospital with a serious condition she's got a little adorable hand-shaped hole in her skull as she's experienced so much stupidity from her own family that she's face palmed herself into having a concussion any more face palming any at all could lead to a terrible stun of growth in her brain making it to be like her family. So they're tasked with not having to expose her to anything stupid, which uh, which gets really hard the second they start. This episode's premise is similar to other ones like the allergy, where they thought that anything stupid would cause Darwin to sneeze. But this one's executed much better because I feel like the writers are in peak form here. They're in the writing room, like that gif of the guy riding fire. Some of the most clever and my favorite jokes of the season are in this episode because they're just so goddamn weird. Like how they gave this grocery store scene a rapping cashier. Man gusta as they say in italy three boxes of cereal huh someone call the fbi we have a serial killer here <laughs> you got a good deal on these pickles i am a dill and i'm working at the till we're supposed to call a checkout but i'm gonna stick my neck out and say till 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 dill dill until so deal with it i am a dill i'm still working at the till earn a diamond earn a nickel with my fickle little pickle say till dill till till a baby so manager talking to a woman's pregnant stomach who then has to consult i'm sorry madam but i'll have to refer to my shareholders guys would you mind stepping in Sure, what seems to be the problem? Some dude's balls. Ball. The twist realization at the end where we see that Anais wasn't actually in this stupor where her family was trying not to be dumb around her and she was actually in a coma the whole time. I think it was cool and kind of scary in a way how they built it up. Her world's starting to phase in and out and drift like it's a dream and the sudden appearance of like pills and heartbeat monitors popping up was uncanny and honestly kind of creeped me the hell out. I could not imagine having a nightmare like this and waking up in a hospital. This episode's a brain buster in the best kind of way. Number 16, the parents. One day shopping in the mall with her family, Nicole runs into some people she'd never expect to see again. What's she doing? Sniffing out a bargain. Your mom's family always had the super ability to save money. Aisle 13. <laughs> Corned beef. 
This can can be opened by women of reasonable intelligence with limited male supervision? Well, they're from the 60s. But look, only 20 cents for the whole pallet. Uh. Hey. Hey! This is our food for the next month! Back up, lady! We saw it first! I grabbed it first! Just leave it already! It's ours! <gasps> dad? Mom? Her mom and her dad. Grandpa Daniel and Granny Mary, baby! Richard's got his parent issues, and in turn, Nicole has her parental issues, where she hates her parents because of the way that they tried to mold her life to be exactly what they wanted, and how she put them through lots of stress during her time with them. But they also put a lot of stress on Nicole raising her, and it just turns into a huge fight when they're invited over to reconcile. They dive into the past on how every single time Nicole wanted to do something, they either said no, or they just stuck her into a new elective, and how Nicole kept on running away when the, her parents were just trying to talk to her and it just turns into like this huge blame game of bringing up stuff from the past to try and justify their hatred for each other but in the end gumball makes a pretty good point with a small song <sighs> okay i know this is the cheapest dirtiest kind of emotional manipulation but there's too much on the line here so ten thousand reasons to give up too many words that piled up i think we should go but you refuse to try and mend Your broken past before the end And no excuses can erase The scars of time left on your face If it's too hard to forgive Then just give Let go of the weight that won't let you live All right, look, look, look. Even though you two don't have the strength to forgive, the least you can do is give. Your parents and everyone around you is constantly getting pulled away, drifting further and further and further by this thing called time. It's kind of a big thing and we can't really stop. And if you have any desire to, you need to realize that one day there won't be any sort of way that you can make it up to each other. The tear jerking song aside though, this episode gives a pretty good view onto Nicole's past and it also humanizes her and Richard a little bit more. The only thing I didn't really like about this one is that it felt kind of rushed in a way, to me at least, because when I look at this compared to like Richard's episode where he reconnected with his dad, him and his dad went through various activities catching up on old childhood memories and we got to see the progression of them reforming their bond. While with Nicole here, it's more of just like, oh, here's years of pent up trauma, quick, uh, gumball, sing a song, make it better. Number 17, the founder. Now this is a, a real strategy, okay? What Richard is doing right now, you should definitely try this in real life. You won't be arrested at all. Richard walks into a company building to use their vending machine, but when he's called out for working there, he gives the best lie possible. The secret catchphrase that'll let you into anywhere if you're lucky enough. I don't need an appointment. I own the place. I'm sorry for keeping you waiting, sir. Please don't fire me. I'll tell the CEO immediately. But he's in for far more than he bargained for when he realized that being a CEO and a founder of a company has some actual responsibility. And it turns out that this company building has been waiting for their CEO and founder to arrive so they can get started on new projects and Richard and responsibility mix like oil and water. So he has to get the fuck out of there. But not before making some company decisions that lead to the literal destruction of their corporation. I do appreciate the jokes in here and Nicole busting in to take Richard back down. What's this now? Wait for it. You have requested the top floor. Three, two, one! You gotta dance to make it go up. And in the end, how Richard ends up bringing down the evil corporation instead of helping them further. That's right, baby, get destroyed, Amazon! I mean, uh nondescript big corporation number 18 the schooling here the boys explore the options of working part-time jobs rather than schooling which is something a big group of people at their age do or want to do but these guys really messed up because they were not ready for the work world at all in fact it's not just the work world they weren't ready for larry's world they messed up and decided to take larry's position in the workforce where they run around and try to do every single thing that he has to do in a day and they are burnt out in five minutes it is. So what do we do? What is that on the timetable? Didn't you read it? I didn't say I'd read it. I said I'd follow it to the last letter. R! 
Oh, good guess. What the hell was that yell? <laughs> ah! Larry's getting a little bit more relaxation time as he's not abused in this episode. It's in that sentiment that everyone should work a retail job was manifested into an episode. Number 19, the intelligence. Gumball pisses off the internet and he poses the challenge to the internet that technology cannot outvalue humans and take over. There's no possible way. But seeing this as a challenge, the internet tries to absorb all human knowledge at once that it even knows and severely overclocks, leading him to dying along with other technology in Elmore. And without being terminally online what else is there to do for elmore i mean they just gotta revert back to ye olden times i know not for my time wheel has stop at a half moon hence also my watch is broken we can no longer summon sustenance from the telephone so we are assembling this day a hunting party of equipped and noble fellows i have my whisk and i my kitchen towel i too have kitchen towel i'm tired of the same people are addicted to technology premise that's been done by pretty much every cartoon at this point and even when gumball first did it i wasn't too much of a fan but i can still appreciate the creativity they used on this approach because the section where everyone was like making fun of ye old times mr robinson desperately tried to get his wife executed was <laughs> a really funny bit to me but i did like this one for 20 the potion this episode is kind of weird and different as it gives us an inside view of hector and his personality and it gets pretty weird all right let, let me let me explain in a different way been having some trouble life around him it continues to crumble one girl's going to kiss him he fumbles he falls in the building and turns into rubble every day feeling like the same struggle just want to experience the life down under luckily got all and darwin they got a solution if they use their magic to craft a solution up ocean that'll shrink him way down zip file they become pressed down finally able to touch on the ground finally able to walk around the town any tricks as he shrunk into normal size it's not everything that he fantasizes. boys need a pot to return his hide or he might just be stuck like this for his whole life he tricks it again hoping he will get bigger but he only ends up expanding his finger the effects of the potion continue to linger and gum on door, try to get him back quicker. Or body gets wider, the problem is dire. He hugs on the spider, and then catches on fire. The boys are scrambling, making the push up. But mom don't notice all of the commotion, like. Like Hector in this one reminds me of Juke and Anton. Not complex, simple, and fun. Spin all day like I'm 21. Savage. <laughs> Spin all day like I'm 21. 21. Number 21, the spin-off. Dr. Wrecker is back and he wants to show us his amazing world. An amazing world without gumball. And shows us, the viewer, a few of his spin-offs that he directed to show how good the world can be without gumball. Now, while I appreciate the try, Rob, this was already done better earlier in the season, and you weren't even there, so. But no, this just gives us show a chance to throw the various characters into different parodies of TV shows like Larry being in Cowboy Bebop and my favorite, the toddler reality show. This is K-pop. This is Timmy. This is Charlie Ann. And this Reality Toddlers. Oh God, what Apple did, bro, was so goddamn dirty. She's a whole snake. I hope she gets thrown off next season. Great stuff, great stuff. Number 22, The Transformation. After a fun and cute Skype call with Gumball and Penny. How about you? Would you still love me if every time we kissed, I shouted, Mama loves her ravioli! I'd say, what a coincidence! That's what I always say under my breath after we kiss. Okay, what if I had a medical condition that meant I produced 10,000 times more sweat than the average person? I'd say you float my boat a little too literally. What if I had a soul patch? Ooh, tough one. <sighs> On my tush! I'd say that's where it belongs. Gumball gets invited by Penny to go over and chill at her place. Ugh, God damn. Once Gumball arrives, he notices that mm, there might be trouble in paradise. Penny! Uh, hello? <laughs> As Penny's family doesn't answer the front door, he tries to go around the back and ends up getting messed up by these fences and hopping into someone else's yard. He ends up butt naked with a dirty cake. But as he approaches, he can hear Penny's family having an argument as they notice him uh, butt ass naked. And once Gumball steps in, he realizes that this is a very volatile argument that he actually has some part in. All right, so you know how Gumball convinced Penny to finally escape her shell in season three? Well, that decision didn't really have full on family approval. It's been a family tradition for the Fitzgerald family to stay in their shells and it's been around for generations and penny argues that 
you know, screw tradition. Let's just be freaking happy. Well, the dad is not budging and consistently arguing that their family should go along with their history. Gumball, feeling more awkward than ever, suggests that Penny's family gets an outside opinion on whether the family should stay in their shells or not. As of course, staying inside these shells have their own pros and cons. Can't you see how distraught she is? She looks fine to me. It all happens on the inside, Gumball. <laughs> I think that's weird. Imagine what it's like going to the bathroom. Hmm. This is the most horrifying image of the season and you could not convince me otherwise. Actually, wait, no, second place to something that comes later. And the family decides that Gumball has to make the decision. And then we get minutes of the family mentally torturing Gumball to be on their side. And when it comes to the point where he has to make the decision and he doesn't know who to side with, either going with their family's tradition or going against it for the girl he loves, he decides to tell a story about a princess. I have made my decision, and to illustrate my point, I'm going to tell you a story. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, in a castle far, far away, lived a king who was irrationally scared of the world outside. Hi, do you know where I can get my parking ticket validated? <laughs> so he decided to close the doors of their castle forever. The king made everyone wear a suit of armor. It wasn't practical, but they got used to it. Apart from one person, the princess, who one day came out of her armor, and she was beautiful. Ah, I think the princess could look a bit better than that. The king was upset she ditched her armor, but the princess wanted everyone else to ditch theirs too, and be themselves. So she invited an impossibly handsome prince to solve the problem. So the prince gave his answer, in the form of a story. Once upon a time, there was a family of cocoons living happily on a tree. One of the cocoons broke open, and from within emerged a beautiful butterfly. The situation was tense, so they called a handsome ladybug boy to help them resolve the problem. And you know what the ladybug said? Once upon a time, there was a family of seeds who lived deep underground. And yeah, this story ends up looping forever. And the Gummo story repeating basically reinforces that he doesn't even know with this animation that I never want to see again in my life. But this actually works as repeating himself over and over with no conclusion is what the Fitzgeralds realized that they were doing the entire time and that maybe they should just accept their differences instead of arguing about who's right. This is the closest Gumball gets when it comes to the topic of religion or any sort of passed down family tradition. This is a massive W from Gumball and he didn't even mean it. Norms versus growth. What should you choose? Number 23, the understanding. There's a new guy on the block named Peter. He's a little piece of pepperoni and Gumball and Darwin are assigned by Principal Brown to be friends with them because he thinks they're the only ones that are dumb enough to understand his broken English. So Peter, what do you want to do first? Well, wherever I'm cool, lunch open the canteen there, the locker, the hunger sandwich, and maybe some ketchup. Is the fun always on, or is the fun not? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. One more time. <laughs> the what I was, I said. Now, why does Peter talk like he was just made in The Sims 4? Well, he speaks like this because his parents tried to homeschool him for all of his life and teach him language. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the pizza couple, a couple that I haven't really talked about in this video, but have been reoccurring characters in earlier seasons, which haven't really had that much time to shine, they are both alt-right anarchists against the government. <laughs> share our views. Peter's always saying how you agree with him on practically everything. About what? About the government. Government? Ah, the government! Don't get me started on the government with their endless farms and their red tape! Ah, ah! Oh, it's the next lunch, honey. And the boys accidentally agreed to come and hang out with Peter and his crazy family in the destruction of hundreds of banknotes and birth certificates so people can be free from the government. Pulling out all the stops with the new gumball topics as they hit flat earthers and the our oh, damn government always banning me off Twitter type of people. These pizzas also don't use the internet and left evidence all over the place with multiple crimes. Also, I like this episode and I did like Peter's lines as well because I can I can understand Peter. I can understand him. Y'all just aren't on the same level. I'm built differently. Number 24, the ad. After Richard's 
spends the Watterson's last money for the month on a beautiful horse, they are dead broke. So broke, they gotta eat goddamn air for breakfast. So to get a little bit of cash on the side, they turn their home into an Airbnb. A home where people can rent out and stay for a few days. And the first customers are these two lovely goats that quickly realize that this home isn't very normal. You see, since the family have nowhere to go, they've all been secretly living in the house while these two old goats use up their house, stealing their food away from their own customers. God damn. That is until one incident where both of them get knocked out. And to make it seem like they weren't knocked out and like they had a great and good vacation, the family scramble around and haul around their lifeless bodies, taking photos of them, making it look like they had fun. The stupid like weekend at Bernie's type plot was I right, seeing them find more and more ways to be creative and scam them out of their money. Is it weird to say I love when this family breaks the law? Eh, it's, just, it's just the facts. And facts don't care about your feelings. Number 25, the ghouls. This is Halloween. This is Halloween. Halloween. Halloween is pretty dumb. So Carrie explains to the boys why she isn't really a fan of Halloween anymore, as it's not fun for ghosts anymore. No one's afraid of ghosts. No one even thinks about ghosts. No one cares about the freaky and haunting stories that are told in these Halloween horror movies or these freaky urban legend passed from kid to kid every Halloween night. It's all about candy now. It's all about candy and posting the, the best Halloween costume and shit. And then we basically get to see a compilation of the ghosts of Elmore and different references to ghostly figures like Freddy Krueger or the Ring Lady. Basically going around Elmore trying to be scary and failing miserably. So Gummo and Darwin decide to help her out by helping out the ghosts and setting free many more demons to make people actually afraid. And it leads to... <laughs> The best part about this is like, that's literally where the episode ends. There's no attempt to fix it. There's no happy ending. It's literally just ghosts now run the world. Everyone's dead. But this is one of the show's best Halloween episodes, bro. Like seeing everyone in their new and improved costume, music, all the ghost references. It's like an update of past Halloween episodes made to be better and cooler. And I gotta say, personal detail I really like is how every single person in Elmore has a different uh, like costume every year. It's not always the same thing. Just a tiny detail I like there. Number 26, The Stink. Mr. Small, being the pacifist that he is, wants to stop hurting all animals by not buying any more animal products. He then realizes that he's still hurting even more animals by not buying animal products, so he goes out to live in the woods where he just ends up killing more animals. It's an endless cycle. And when the boys stumble into the woods he went into looking for him, they encounter the mighty Stink Ape, which is a mighty creature who desperately needs a shower. It's like if Bigfoot was a Redditor. And they need to escape his stench before he grabs onto them. When they realize, oh, wait a minute, there's no such thing as a stink ape that's mr small whereas mr small lives in the woods he starts to go crazy and actually succumb to eating animals even when they see the actual stink ape mr small forgot that he set a trap for him and they, they kill him they kill off this mighty species this episode will only really stick with me for the star trek crew controlling gumball gumball one the viewers are getting bored gumball three quick do you have anything Gumball one please help us out bro hmm. play gumball twerking with vineboom.mp4 27, the awareness. Gumball was caught one day on a walk to school being insensitive to plants, calling all plants useless. Yeah, well, it's only Green Week. I mean, there's nothing special about plants. Think about it. Superheroes are all named after animals and insects for a reason. Only to have a plant literally walk right by him. Goddamn racist. And to make it up to him, Gumball tries to become cultured and acquainted with plant life, which only leads to him being more and more offensive as he tries to appropriate plant culture. And then Leslie ends up making a bunch of lies about things that plants do so he can go and do all this crazy stuff. Joe, honey, dinner trip. Did you have a nice day at school? No. No, I did not. Until they're literally falling out of a plane and their parachute almost doesn't go off. It's kind of just a back and forth where Gumball was being a douche, so Leslie was a douchebag. Because what even sparked his hatred of plants here? And why would he say this even when he's acknowledged that one of his best friends is a plant? Number 28, the slip. An evil eagle delivery man decides not to give Richard his online delivery because he was a few minutes late to pick it up. Uh, uh, I caught you. I can take my package now. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> You're confused. For my fancy clothes, you must think I'm some sort of wealthy lord. But I am actually Richard Watterson, and that package is for me. So I'll take it now. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I can see it. Can't you just give it to me? Yeah, sure. I'll just give it to you. If rules and regulations mean nothing to you. And even though Richard was right there next to him, it's company policy. Mm, so sorry. And this evil eagle keeps on messing with Richard and making him late for his package until Richard has to track him down and get the package back himself. Now, I didn't really like this episode for reasons. Anyway, next one. Uh, number 29. No, no, no. Let me explain. I, you didn't have anyone to root for. Gummo and Darwin act like brats. The delivery guy is cruel and for no reason, and he just pops up so randomly. And Richard is just Richard. His whole bit revolves around how dumb he is, and I get that. But sometimes he's so dumb, it gets annoying, and it just brings a whole episode to a drag. Number 29, the drama. Darwin and Carrie, or Carwin, or Derry. The W couple are getting along great as of recently, going on dates, sharing their lives, which seeing these dates is really cool to me because it really shows the dichotomy in their two characters how darwin sees the world as beautiful and y you should be nice to everyone and how life should be appreciated and carrie 300 year old ghost girl can see demons all around and it doesn't really care about life and just seeing these two end up getting along and have fun is so goddamn cute to me they end up sharing their lives on social media which only makes people like leslie and masami jealous which makes them wonder if there's any behind the scenes drama with the couple that they're hiding from everyone so they go to gumball for him to spill what do you want then carrie and darwin come on dish the dirt there is no dirt they literally look like what you get when you search perfect couple online come on they have nothing in common surely you have a little doubt no why do you care anyway <gasps> uh who are you i'm doubt but i don't have any doubt are you sure Are you really, really sure? Mm -hmm. See? I don't have- So Gumball, worried for Darwin, then starts spying on them to figure out if there's actually any sort of trouble in paradise. Nothing much really happens until Carrie runs into her ex-boyfriend, Asriel, and he wants to chop it up with Carrie after years of not talking to her, and Gumball thinks Darwin's about to get cheated on. Cucked. Right there. And once they connect again, there's then this running scene as the boys head to the cemetery where Carrie is hanging out with Asriel so Gumball can stop any cheating. And the comic book looking animation style, mwah. How can you not be threatened by this guy? understand how that meme works. There are a lot of Gen Z memes in this episode, like others, but I like them a lot better than some of the other ones we've had in this season. And by the end, when they actually see that Carrie wasn't cheating and her and Darwin connect, that, this sick animation change, the dates of the beginning, really carry this episode to be hugely enjoyable from start to finish. Number 30, the buddy. Speaking of dichotomy, the unlikeliest of friendships, Jamie, the brute, and Anais, the brain, both are sent to find out who installed a virus on the school computers. Now, the reason that these two specifically were paired together still doesn't really make that much sense to me, but it doesn't really matter because the matchup is actually pretty good, surprisingly. Similar to the Darwin and Julius episode, we see two characters with no previous interaction, complete opposite personality traits, have an episode with them both as major characters, and I really like that sort of premise. It answers a lot of what ifs I had about the series, and it shows that they're experimenting with new things and new combinations of characters, as this being another time where Gumball doesn't show up once. And I just like how Anai is going around trying to solve this case with her brain using detection clues and Jamie just brute forcing everything. I also think it's cute watching Anais try to be cool and threatening with her 3-2 head ass. And I'm happy to say this is the best we've seen of Jamie in the entire series. Just a cool girl who's funny, not trying to constantly kill, beat, or abuse people is my favorite sort of Jamie so far. This season's on such a good streak, man. It feels like they matured and really come into its own and they're refining past ideas and making them great or introducing new little elements to it to make them even better. Number 31, the possession. Sometimes we'll attach memories to possessions that were significant at the time of those memories. But it is important.
important to know when to let go and move on from that object. The Watersons want to get rid of their old ass fridge because it barely works, and Richard can't well just watch them get rid of it because that's his favorite fridge. So they, 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 it has so much, so many memories attached to it. He can't just get rid of it. But then Granny Jojo shows up and she reveals that she actually bought the fridge from the awesome store, and we find out the fridge actually stores memories and leads to the alternate icy dimension like it's Narnia. And the family need to help Richard let go and get him out of this fridge dimension and save him from the past. A fridge that goes to Narnia is such a gumball theme to an episode, and I do like how they're using the awesome store for more episodes. I think this guy in the van holds more potential than most of the characters in the show, with all the crazy stuff he's got going on in the back there. But regardless, Nicole getting along with Granny Jojo was nice to watch for the first time ever. Number 32, the master. And by master, I mean dungeon master. Because the Watersons, after having one rough night, try out Dungeons and Dragons, a game about using your imagination in a show about an imagination, combination is A1. And Richard is the DM here, and he's the main thing I liked about this episode. He had such determination and patience to make this story work, it's crazy. You would wish that you had Richard as your DM, because he just works through all the family having their disagreements and trying to form a story out of their scuffles and breaking out into fights. Because at this point, the whole family was mad at each other and having a lot of infighting, and it annoyingly kept on breaking the roleplay. No matter what, Richard sucked at playing the game, and in the end, brought them together to beat the final boss. Reminds me of the console from season five with the game literally coming to life, but this time it's the whole family together. I don't have much else to say, but D&D plus Gumball goes hard. Number 33, the silence. After long years of conversation and friendship, we've gotten to the penultimate point. Gumball and Darwin, have run out of things to say to each other. And there's a deafening silence between them and most of their conversations now. So they try to look for any solution to solve their silence issue, including uh, 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 alternative medicine. Did someone say alternative medicine? I love how Mr. Small flies in at even the slightest whisper of sacred remedies. And in the end, the boys realize that after a song and a long chase, that maybe, maybe they're just they're just fine with silence now because they know each other so well, which I mean, that's fair. And look at that Gumball and Darwin make these nightmarish faces as they literally cannot come up with anything to say. Relatable, hilarious, and perfect for screenshots. Number 34, the future. So we've already figured out in the past that Banana Barbara can somehow paint pictures of the future. And nobody knows why she can do this, not even her. But an interesting detail is that her pictures have gone from events that are gonna happen in the show to nothing but this strange static. And after completing her most recent piece, she meets Rob in the corner of her room who wants to use her power for evil. And the boys, once they find out that he's drawing things into reality, sort of like Sarah, the boys actually have to stop him before he destroys their entire world using his power. Can I just say, damn bro, Dr. Wrecker here is a good villain. Like you can tell whenever he's on the screen or when he, uh, whenever he's doing a plan, he's not a hundred hundred percent evil. He still has a lot of human moments, but he is pretty easy to hate with how selfish and cruel he can be at points. And it comes to a penultimate point where Gumball, Darwin, and Rob have to have a battle here, and they use the artwork to their advantage with everything coming true. And it really reminds me of that remote fight scene that Gumball and Rob had, but in a fresh new coat of paint. Very cool indeed. And hopefully soon we get to find out the mystery of why Barbara can only paint static in the future. Oh, can you give him something lame like a goatee or a third nostril or something? <laughs> Perfect. See ya in the future, Rob! But there is no future. Number 35, The Wish. Miss Simeon and Printable Brown. The turbulent relationship looks like it's finally coming to an end when Brown takes advice from some of the boys to keep his emotions bottled up, stay silent about how he really feels. Oh. Whoa, what's wrong? I don't know how to express my feelings towards Lucy. Uh, feelings? You don't need feelings, you're a guy. Feelings on guys are like elbows on a fish. They just get in the way. I know how I feel. I just can't seem to find the words. Huh, words? You don't need words, you're a guy. Words from a guy are like armbands and an octopus. You don't need them. So what do I say? You say nothing. A guy should be silent. A lone wolf riding off into the sunset. That's not really how relationships work. So Miss Simeon feels hurt and decides to break up with him and tries to leave the city as she thinks that Brown is hiding something from her. And the boys, once they walk in and Miss Simeon's gone, they accidentally think that with the help of a magic gnome that they turn Miss Simeon into a neck pillow. Where is she? <gasps> Dude, look what's happened. What? I think our wishes were granted, and Miss Simeon's been transformed into a- But that chair's always been there. No, dude. The neck pillow. She's been turned into a neck pillow. <laughs> the one you're sitting on. 
Oh, Lucy, is it really you? So Gumball Darwin and Principal Brown try to track down this neck pillow as it bounces around and gets tossed around from person to person to person until it ends up on the back of the bus that the actual Miss Simeon is on, which, which they end up chasing in Principal Brown's car without knowing that Miss Simeon's in there. Thinking that they turned Miss Simeon into a neck pillow, going on a race with a sewer rat, and believing in magical gnomes, all goes to show you how this show is just... wacky as fuck dude but honestly dude i i gotta say i wasn't really feeling most of this episode initially the sort of idea of it uh, believing that miss simeon got transformed into a neck pillow was a little bit too wacky but i get they weren't trying to be serious here it's all wacky fun and jokes i just didn't find it all that funny so i think it's just okay uh I, 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 I. holy shit i can be spongebob number 36 the factory it's bring your kid to work day for richard even though he doesn't really have a job so the kids beg to go over to nicole's job at the rainbow factory and nicole refuses because gumball and darwin are gumball and darwin and i completely understand that like seriously if you invited gumball and darwin over to your job they'll probably find a way to put your nudes on like a billboard and blow up the entire factory oh, okay they actually they actually blew up the factory nicole is interviewing two investors for a very important business meeting at their job but after seeing how miserable the whole establishment was the rainbow factory not being full of rainbows the boys try to help nicole in her meeting by hitting the big red button and boom. they then have to try and escape the factory and override the toxic gas like a saw room and they have to fight through everything and luckily they manage and the episode ends on a good note a fully good ending with this whole huge corporation coming down and gummo and darwin saving the day crazy bro a fully good ending where there's no last second twist trying to be squeezed in they just managed to save the day and everyone gets a raise good for them Number 37, the agent. Darwin! Oh, Darwin! Oh, Darwin, where are you? There you are! Oh, man! My makeup's running. Gumball becomes 007 in this episode, and it goes hard. Gumball and Darwin are forced to walk around looking like the world's worst prom couple. I mean, to be honest, Darwin looks kind of bad. And because he's dressed like one, this whole episode revolves around Gumball pretending to be a secret agent, being assigned by Principal Brown to find who's been stealing various items from the school PA system, toilet paper, and even Bobber's body parts. And you know for a fact that this episode being themed around James Bond, that the music will slap just as hard as it does in the films. I don't point it out often unless it's like a full-on song or a music-based episode, but I'm gonna use this point to address it all. The background music in Gumball has improved massively. Like for some of these scenes in this goofy show, they got full-on orchestras in there for dramatic effect. And it actually turns out that the one stealing all these parts from the school was one character that we never expect. <gasps> I bought Wait, I, I legitimately forgot his name. Hold on. William, William. William stole all these parts from the school so he can walk around and talk like a real boy. And trying to get these parts back leads to another incredible chase scene with some good music. Add that all together and you got a fire episode on your hands. Bruh. Number 38, The Web. I personally think that this episode should get an award for how goddamn stupidly accurate it is. Nicole reads about keeping your children safe on the internet, which leads her to become paranoid about it. No, come on, let me Mom, but that's what the magazine said I should do. They meant parental locks on the computer. Oh, right. After seeing this, the boys kind of question her knowledge about current technology and find out she's gone full on mom. She doesn't know about antiviruses. She clicks on random links. She likes minion memes. What in God's name is an email address? And as I go to her office to see other people of her age operating technology, it slowly starts to set into their minds that these are the people in power of the world of business of money. The people literally in charge of their entire future and lives don't even know how to use a mouse half the time, which if this is not the realist message that they've put in a gumball episode and at the end we get this really good song with a message that's still so relevant it hurts we made it through the ice age the plague and two world wars but now we're facing doom with computers in the hands of dinosaurs they go online, click every link, like puppets of Big Brother Inc. Surrendering their privacy to every pop-up ad they see. Feel the doom impending, cause stupidity is hashtag. 
Stupidity is hashtag trending. It's one of my favorite songs in Gumball because of all the dumb stuff you see on the internet. It's all just compressed into this actual good rap. And I, I like the visuals here and the animation around them. It's one of the best cultural reference episodes for sure. Number 39, The Mess. Let's take this season one episode and push it somewhere else. Gumball and Darwin are assigned to take care of a small child. This time, it's Penny's adorable little sister, Polly. Being sleep deprived the night before from looking at memes all night didn't really help at all. And the two end up losing not only Polly, but their whole grip of reality as they constantly fall in and out of consciousness as they're trying to look for where Polly went. And after they stumble through the day, they wake up beaten and battered, but with Polly in their hands. And since they can't really remember what happened, Polly explains how she was with them the entire day through their stumbling around and shows the different antics they got into while sleep deprived with her, including tackling this dude and starting a kissing booth. Okay, but what about the fight with Tina? That happened when you bumped into a charity worker who asked if you wanted to save a child. We only wanted a couple of dollars, but apparently you guys decided to give above and beyond. This is all for you, Polly. Okay, Tina, let's get on with it. Um, actually, I'm in line for Darwin. Uh, 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 sorry, but I'm the only one who's allowed to kiss Darwin. That's in the rule book, right here. Why does every girl want Darwin in the show, man? Polly is such a goddamn cute character, dude. Just the sweetest character in the show, easily. Just so innocent and loves life and everyone. But anyway, while I was watching this, all I could think about was the major improvements in the jokes, art style, editing, and musics all the way since season one. It really makes me reflect on how far the shows came. And I even see Gumball and Penny's relationship getting better as recently they're starting to have a few more arguments and disagreements but they always get back together and still love each other i think that also goes to show why they're so good because they're not the the perfect relationship they actually do have their disagreements and it feels more human like that way episode 40 the heart after years of simping for this man the boys finally realize that maybe their relationship with mr robinson is a little bit unhealthy. After overhearing a conversation about how much he really hates them, like seriously loathes their guts. Yes, the ones I hate. into installing a new defense system against themselves. They're bigger suckers than leeches making major life choices based on their horoscopes. And they're so ugly. The little red one's got a face even two mothers could love. And the blue one is like a visual version of drinking orange juice right after brushing your teeth. They then take some time away from him, and while they're gone, Robinson finally realizes how much of a douche he's been to these little kids their entire life. And we realize that Mr. Robinson has this sort of inability to commit to feelings and actually express what his heart feels with him being so cruel for so long. So he tries to connect back with the boys, which doesn't work initially, but the clips out of context are so goddamn good. Uh, I don't see how things will ever be the same again, short of brainwashing them. <gasps> but of course, how to brainwash children. What did you do? I followed the advice online. He even connects back with Rocky as he talks about how to make friends with these kids again. Let's play a game? Oak. Oak. What the actual what are you doing? I just got you more followers. Hello. How you doing? Hey. You Dad, please, stop. I know I'm not cut out for prison. There were some real tough cookies in there. Dad, stop. <laughs> and after connecting again, the boys realize that Robinson's heart is hurt. Robinson's heart is bad. So they try to heal it back again with a beautiful song about expressing emotion. Put on your heart and love. Literally. Funny 
you best Robinson episode to date. First and only one that really makes me sympathize with him and actually really root for him as a character. Big W. Number 41, the revolt. Think about all of the objects you're using right now. The monitor or phone you're seeing this on. The headphones you're using to listen to this. The chair or bed your butts are rested on. Toothbrush, your food, your underwear getting a mouthful right now. The objects you use every single day are forced by your hands to do whatever you want. They are slaves. And after realizing this, Darwin, he wants to set them all free. You know, have a revolution for the objects everywhere. Even though he's literally wearing shoes. And bring freedom to the objects of Elmore. Yes, bring freedom to the objects of Elmore. Dude, they're just objects. But don't you want to make your own choices? We give people choice. We don't need our own. But there's so much of the world to see. Nah, eh, everything's on the internet now anyway. No, you're missing the point. Darwin's gotta be anti-human spy, bro, because the way he's trying to force these objects to fight for what they want, even though they're telling him, like, that's what they were built for, they'd rather just serve people. It was a very strange motive that I didn't really get why he was pushing so hard, but Darwin does actually start up a revolt when he tells the objects about how they get thrown away and sent to dumps and not even really used properly. And everything goes to hell. Look at what you did, Dar. This is, look what you did. But this weird and terrifying reality is where our, our objects use us back was an abstract and pretty cool idea, so thanks for that, but I also have no clue why you thought this would be a good idea at all, Darwin. Number 42, the decisions. Darwin, being the doormat that he is, realizes that Gumball is a terrible mentor to him, and since he can't make his own decisions for himself, he goes to Alan to help him make decisions now. Why can't I eat chocolates instead of vegetables? Because, sweet child, chocolate is fun for a treat, but hey, vegetables... Hey, yo, Alan. Alan, what you doing, <laughs> Alan? <laughs> Alan, what? Alan! And technically, his life improves, but eventually, he starts just becoming Alan and being controlled by him like a little virus. But Darwin really has to learn to be his other person as he's just starting to become a copy of whoever he spends time around. Thankfully though, at the end, he doesn't end up choosing either side as the mall starts to literally flood and Gumball and Alan try to save it, but they also end up almost drowning. Darwin finally has to think for himself and save them both using his fish abilities. And it's a good message about thinking for yourself. I don't know when Darwin became so comfortable with being called a sidekick or a doormat, Gumball's assistant, it's all that. Wasn't there literally a whole episode on how he hated being called that everywhere, but I guess he just decided to come around to it. Darwin has a really weird change in characters for these last three episodes. I'm not fully a fan of it, but I do like how he did come to and start making decisions for himself. Number 43, the BFFs. So y'all know furries, right? Not furries. Darwin answers the door one day to find a Furby at his front door. When Gumball comes to meet up with him, he figures out that this is Gumball's random old best friend that he had before Darwin. Darwin, this is Fuzzy, my BFF! to meet you. And he never talked about him up until that point. And you know, Darwin's not jealous at all. Not jealous whatsoever. He doesn't give a darn. And he wants us to know that he doesn't give a darn. So how long were you guys a thing? A few years before you arrived and before you... Mm. Mm. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, I was just trying to work out if I give a darn. <sighs> So was it serious? Yeah, you know, things were moving along. We'd moved into a hideout together. Uh, what are you doing now? Oh, just looking for a darn to give. Were there others? No, of course not. You're Take this. I'm afraid that's all the darns I have to give. And Darwin here acts like a crazy girlfriend trying to find out everything he can know about Gumball's ex to make sure that they don't become best friends again. To which he goes a little bit too far and gets a little bit too intense with the furry. Gumball decides after Darwin acts super weird, he's gonna go with Fluffy to a sleepover all the way in Minnesota. After a long trek and a journey through the Midwestern mountains, Gumball finally ends up at Fluffy's place and realizes that Darwin was right the whole time. Welcome back, Gumball. What the what is going on here? You abandoned me, Gumball. You promised we would stay BFFs forever, but you replaced me. Put this on. What? But it's for toddlers. It's too small. Put it on! <laughs> now you're gonna make up for it, starting right where we left off. And life is gonna be one long sleepover. <laughs> now. Let's play. Until Darwin shows up to save the day. And then a chase scene ensues as they try to escape. There were things here that I didn't like about Darwin and things that I did. What I did like was the I don't give a darn and him being jealous can be sort of cute sometimes. Kind of similar to when it happened in the bros. I just don't know how over the course of this latest season, I feel like Darwin is de-aging. Like there was one point where Darwin started standing up for himself, really started coming to his own as a character, having his own life, making his own decisions. But now he just sounds younger and acts more immature than 
than ever before. It's really weird to me. So territorial over Gumball and waiting for him to be at the door for hours like a lonely puppy. But Gumball is funny and Fluffy as a character, uh, even though it was really random, I think he'd serve its purpose and made for some funny jokes and reminded me that Furbies exist. So I immediately hated him. And here we get to it. Episode 44 the inquisition as of 2022 the series finale the final episode of the amazing world of gumball as of right now and it's not that good so the time has come the superintendent of elmore comes down to visit elmore junior high to see if everyone's in order and to like boss him around to be better and the boys seem as suspicious and i don't really know why i mean it's not like his name is mr evil or anything but it's also because it seems like he wants to destroy elmore's cartoonish antics completely him being a real human wants to ban all fictional activities or anything that breaks the laws of real world physics and after seeing their friends transform gumball and darwin realize something dastardly he's trying to turn everyone and in Elmore into real world humans just like himself. Gumball, Darwin, you're next. Masami? Sure, <laughs> we'll be right with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who are you? I'm Tina. <laughs> Who are you? I'm Tobias. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Uh, saucy? Yeah. Okay, that's a massive improvement. <laughs> Trust me, this is in your best interest. What are you doing to them? Fixing them, and their transformation is almost complete. Almost? And to do this, he also needs to transform them into these weird magic school bus looking art style kids. And to get away from the realism, the boys have to use their cartoon abilities to overcome them and also turn them back into cartoons by using more cartoony antics. like hitting the floss on Banana Joe. And after being able to fix everybody once everyone's turned back, Mr. Evil gets folded. <laughs> but once everyone goes up to him, we find out that he's not the real superintendent Mr. Evil, but Rob in a disguise. But apparently he was trying to turn all the characters into humans for a reason. Rob knows about something, something terrible that's coming and the reason why all these weird things have been happening with the universe and in elmore recently live in ignorance about what's gonna happen here or listen to what i have to say it might just save your lives okay good and he's about to say what it is until he gets just absolutely curb stomped by Tina. We time skip to later in the day when everyone's left and rob experiences the first stages of whatever he says is the end Stop me! Transformation is the only chance they have of escaping to the other place when this world... Oh no, it started. Rob fucking dies. And we're left on the to be continued as we wait for the final gumball movie to answer all of our questions. N nah, bro. This didn't even really feel like an episode or a finale, but more like a teaser to set up the movie more than anything. If we're going to count this as a whole on episode, I don't think it's a very good one. Super evil guy we've never heard of shows up, tries to ruin all of Elmore, turns out to be Rob, then gets beat up for no reason when he tries to explain why he did everything. Seriously, there's no reason why Tina should even do this. Everyone was ready to hear him speak but for some reason no one had a problem with her beating the shit out of him also why did they just leave him there in the school the two good things about this one though are really good things like the gumball and darwin using their cartoon abilities to get around these real world characters and that ending oh the suspense the suspense i like it it's a good build-up but the rest of it eh, i just kind of felt 
indifferent. It's pretty mid. I don't think anything could have prepared me for how accurate this ending ended up being. This whole plot was based around some real guy coming to Elmore trying to turn everyone real and get rid of all the cartoons. And initially I thought like, oh, okay, what a weird premise. Until it actually just happened with Discovery <laughs> and Warner Bros. Along with HBO Max deciding to just not host the Gumball movie anymore or a bunch of other cartoon shows. If you don't know about the Warner Bros and Discovery situation, what's been going on over there recently is goddamn diabolical what they're doing to a lot of creators of various movies and cartoon shows. I'd recommend doing some research on it yourself and some creators of cartoons out there that you might love like OKKO or Infinity Train and show them some of your support for what's been going on. That's the only message I really wanted to give out about this. But thankfully, we don't have to end this on a bad note because we get to talk about the spinoffs, baby. After the final episode of Gumball, there were two new mini series that were started called Darwin's Yearbook and the Gumball Chronicles. And both of these are sort of similar as they're both mainly clip shows that involve some new form of animation. But some of them do have themes and cool little endings to them that I do want to see. And oh man, they're only available on HBO Max, bro. Where are the plans? Where are the plans for this? Oh, drop $15 for this video. I don't care. So I just sat here for about two and a half hours and I don't know what to say. I don't really know if I could rank these individually as they're all so similar and some of them even lead into each other. But yeah, most of it is just showing past clips that I've already went over and with little smidges of new content added in. Just to review them real quick, Darwin goes around the school and asking who could be on the cover of the yearbook, going to various people to see if they have a good picture to put on it. And one thing I really like is that we get to see a little bit more detail and a little bit more personality of the characters that are consulted. And the first one with Banana Joe, we see is a goofball that loses all the time and he's a little bit wacky in the head. Next episode is Clayton, but Clayton doesn't even show up in it. It's mostly Tobias, as Tobias is selfish and wants to be on the cover of the yearbook. Oh, yeah, I've been meaning to ask. What happened to your sister, Rachel? Oh, she's gone. Gone? Like gone the way of the dinosaur? No, gone to college, obviously. Anyway, cool party, right? Next one's probably my favorite because it's about Carrie. Hey. 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 What you thinking about? Us. Me too. <laughs> I just need me a carry in my life, bro. Also, one of my favorites has got to be Alan, because that, that's where we really see the negative side of it. During the dialogue, we, it's revealed to us that Alan has only been doing a lot of these good things because he has a massive ego and wants to be seen as this god above everyone else. Cool. I'll go with him then. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, there's so much going on there. Okay, thanks, Alan. You're a star. Cool. But, uh, I want- Bye! Okay then, Gregor. <laughs> oh, my bad. They weren't meant for you. I was trying to drag them to the trash. Please delete them. I look awful. Okay. <laughs> Bye. They're all done. Whee! I mean, we always knew this, but it's only being reinforced now. Then we have Sarah's Funniest Moments, and we have this little compilation that's actually a parody of My Name Is by Eminem. And last but not least, we have The Teachers, where Darwin decides on a teacher to put on the front cover. After that's the Gumball Chronicles! You see, during the Halloween episode, the ghouls, uh, Alan and Leslie, come across the Ring Lady, who then shows them a tape of the creepiest things that have happened in Elmore, and how they all relate in one very weird way. In all of these terrifying clips, there's one entity that resides in all of them. <laughs> Oh, surely you can see it. I can see I need a facial. Wait, I can see him. He was behind the pillar, right? Yes, Alan. And your family has been affected by him more than any. Please, I have a son! Oh, the clown guy. Yes, the clown guy. Three, two, one. He is always watching. Why would you add a scary clown through a window instead of a... For every scary thing in Elmore, he is there. In plain sight. Lurking. Waiting. The clown is everywhere. Huh? Yeah, I mean, need editing, but I saw that twist coming about ten minutes ago. Sorry. Oh, I feel silly now. I guess there's only one more thing to say. Go on. Happy Halloween! <laughs>
No one knows why he's there or how he gets there. After this is when the school president arc starts. Where Gumball wants to run for school press, but he has no one as vice president to help him out. You gotta ask everybody. We well, you know what happens if you ask Penny. Almost broke up. Okay. No. How about Leslie? Leslie's Leslie's cool. That's right. He's almost killed him multiple times. All right. How about Bobber? Dangerous robot. It's not long until Gumball realizes that he's only really compatible with one other person, and that's Darwin. But Darwin's already running for president with a knife, so there's not much he can really do. And after facing the reality of the situation and the responsibility that comes with being a school press, he drops out. Then right after that, the three episodes, Ancestor Act, Mother's Day, and Elmore's Most Wanted are all themed clip shows based on the Watterson family, Nicole's funniest and scariest moments, and Richard breaking the law. And bundling these all together, I'd say it's a really nice and enjoyable two and a half hour ride that I would actually recommend to people if you've seen the series or not. Because it does a good job introducing you to various characters and still showing you various clips, even if you don't know the context. I really saw it as positive and it felt really nice to see. If I was going to rank them individually, I'd group them up into like these single big episodes. I'd put the Gumball Chronicles above Darwin's yearbook because uh, Gum Gumball Chronicles told more stories with it and, and Darwin's yearbook felt way more like a clip show. Oh, and how could I forget Waiting for Gumball? I totally didn't find out about this today, which was a short Cartoon Network miniseries based around the art style they used in the Puppets episode, where they get into more silly and funny antics. I'm gonna be honest, each episode is one minute. I didn't really feel like ranking this one. It's more original than the other spinoffs, so I'm gonna put it uh, in the middle. Anyway, that's that, baby! All of Gumball done! Let's go! This video's gonna be sick! Hi. As we come up on the final section of the video, I want to give out some awards to a few of the Gumball episodes, okay? I'm going to name my top four best and my top four worst Gumball episodes. Let's start with the best. Fourth best, I'm going to say, is The Shell. Just a beautiful episode from start to finish, and it changed the show completely. No matter if you're a simp for Penny or not, it's a beautiful episode. Third best is The Choices. So much creativity was put into forming these storylines and seeing the origins of how Nicole and Richard met was so goddamn cute, man. It literally defines the show, but not as much as as the second best in my opinion the origins part two part one was good but part two was just better because we actually got the conclusion of the story in that one it was a good conclusion it was cute i loved it the number one best episode is the kids uh dude, i and i enjoyed it the most it defines the point of the show perfectly it's it, it's animated great that song will be stuck in my head now let's get into the top four worst fourth worst is the laziest the most boring episode of gumball ever made it was only in season one it was when they were getting a feel of the show it's just if you compare that to like what the show the show as a whole it's pretty pretty bad third worst is the worst that is a confusing ass sentence fitting name for an episode that i didn't really enjoy it only really had one joke that made me laugh the message they were going for i get it but it wasn't very entertaining second worst has got to be the limit as it shows a family being all really unlikable and all their characters being really bland and that's one i can just immediately remember when i can think of episodes i didn't like but it's not the worst of all time number one worst episode of gumball of all time in my opinion is the girlfriend the message it gives out the joke's not hitting and jamie being the main focus back in her completely unlikable era this is one of the episodes that it's not even so bad it's good it's just you're you're it's, you're, it's gonna annoy you if you watch it but at the end of the day we're talking about gumball and their four worst episodes are still better than the, in some entire shows <laughs> but in all seriousness yo i i never in my wildest dreams could like imagine a video I put out something that's different from the other stuff I've been doing. Something I just wanted to do out of pure passion for animation and the show would hit like more than a million views, get like a ten to thousand pe people like finding out about my existence. And I, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to anyone who's clicked on that video. If that video has helped you go to sleep, if any of my videos have helped you through hard times, it's it's crazy. And here's the hoping that a lot of you come back and watch more. I'll do more videos like these on other cartoons I like, but I can't just do these all the time. I was looking at the comments, people were like. Like saying a hundred different shows to do this with hundreds of their own episodes. I'm like, are y'all trying to kill me? But I will do this more times as this has been pretty fun for me. And I, I see that you guys are having fun with it. I got a discord. You can join with a bunch of friendly faces. Anyway, I hope you all have a wonderful day or night or uh, shit if you're on the toilet. I'm gonna go work on the next thing. Uh, actually though, thank you so much. Peace hey. out. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. If you like RT60, you should like and subscribe.